They say time's a heater, but I hope for its own security, time's got a lawyer. In the same breath, they'll say that old wounds open easy. I didn't forget. I've only gotten this far by knowing when to let go, when to give up. And even though I've spent the better part of this fruitless fight for justice careening off the collapsing edge of insanity, I've been complacent, culpable, compliant with those hell-bent on setting flame to what was already a car crash of a crime-stopping career. I don't forget. I feel that raw, pure, crystallized fury, that hatred and resentment preserved within those icy droplets of spittle fired like little Trojan missiles, not caring to break my bones, but to slip inside the eye of my mind to let me know that even if I do not move on, no one will forget that I tried to. I will never forget. Though I only survived that sweltering summer heat wearing the facade of an ice-cold investigator, there's nothing more bitter, not that early morning bluster, not the bite of a late night blizzard, than leaving a case out to die. Knowing that you could have done more, resigned to the fact that rather you, like the rest of the wayward souls hoping to do some semblance of good in this world long since lost, are cursed to tread through the mire, the humid mist, that scorched sand slipping through your fingers. I'd made my peace. I'd agreed to forget, with respect to the powers that be. So to those who wonder how I sleep at night, it isn't by choking down whatever supplement sleep doctors hate. We all hide from the truth, but the truth arrives sight swinging all the same, or rather, ringing. The echoes of a voice lost to time. There are certain stories, stones that forever lie forbidden to be turned, not in respect to the sheer weight, the heft, how heavy, how much it will hurt to heave, but rather for the horrors that doubtlessly lay beneath. For fear of what will surely follow, for fear of fate following close, waiting to release its wrathful... Mm. But I never did forget. And though I knew, no, even though I could see something, someone lurking just beneath the surface, I could not abide the risk, stomach, that terrible dread, that uneasy nausea, that vice-like fear. Bear the weight of opening Pandora's box on my shoulders. Maybe I was being selfish, maybe I was. But, but no. When they murdered F-Zero in cold blood, I watched. When they abducted the youthful Pikmin never to be seen again, I watched. When they stole the soul, siphoned away the magic of Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, I watched. But I'm done watching. The task of figuring out what happened, who was culpable, and how everything collapsed so astronomically was not one undertaken with any semblance of understanding how enormous the task at hand was. We did not know how deep the rabbit hole went, we did not realize how crucial the service serviced by that lovable mascot Sheen was, how much it coated over that seedy undersurface grit. You are here for a reason, you are watching but one part of a comprehensive total thorough retrospective analysis and breakdown. Who stole the soul of a beloved childhood classic and who masquerades today, slinking around wearing some semblance of a facade of fraudulent facsimile, the hollow husk of a corpse that was something pure and inherently magical. This is the rise, the fall, the who, what, where and why of the death of something magnificent. Who stole the magic? Mario and Sonic at the Summer Olympic Games. Welcome to what I know as 
the graveyard of dreams. Each year to mark the end of the summer term of school, the principal would gather all the children from each class in this field and make them compete for the honour of the gold medal. The tasks were not always simple, but they would always be blunt, raw and honest in what they would ask each individual of pure, unrelenting, unceasing physical exertion. For not only was the price of victory high, but the penalty for loss, the toll losing was exact, was great. Each race, each challenge would be approached by fearful children, their nails bitten down to their roots, knowing that a loss would mean that their life could never be the same, not for the entirety of the next six hours. Running, jumping, three-legged wheelbarrow, each race would come and go, but then the main events begin. The ultimate test of metal, the purest of challenges, the race that was anyone's to win and everyone's to lose. The Egg and Spoon Race. In Ireland, we used potatoes because, obviously, it did not matter how much you prepared for this race, anything could happen. Nothing was a guarantee. The more you thought you could predict the outcome, the more cruel fate would treat you. You were on your own as you stood at the starting block, potato or egg in hand, spoon in the other, staring down the grim reaper, stroking his scythe at the finish line. Before the race begins, you feverishly look around to see what everyone else is doing. Everyone has their own trick, their own superstitious belief, their own misconception that they can bend fate to their will. You yourself have your own technique, one you are certain is definitive, one you know will bring home the ultimate reward. Then, as the whistle blows, you place the egg on the spoon and... Now, as I look back on this traumatic event, as I cast my matured eyes around this field, uh, one thing is abundantly clear to me. The egg and spoon race, um, was f***ing stupid. Yeah, you, you could prepare, you could practice running, you could practice balancing, you could even come up with a wild and wacky technique that is definitive, but in the end of the day, nothing was a guarantee. And that is why the egg and spoon race was the greatest. It was why it was the most iconic game of my childhood, and was doubtlessly the same for so many others, because that is what sport should be. That is the distillation of the magic that made me and so many others fall in love with sport. No matter the form, the upset, the underdog story, the idea of a meritocracy where Anyone from any background can rise above the most privileged to stake their claim to the throne. The big guy can change the rules when he wants to. Sports provide a platform where the big guy can't do that anymore. Where anyone can win at anything. Sports are inherently magical. Broly Legs is one of the greatest Street Fighter players of all time. He has ascended to the pinnacle of Street Fighter's competitive esports leagues, all in spite of the fact that he suffers from arthrogryposis, a condition that causes severe stiffness, contractures and weakness throughout the body. Broly plays Street Fighter without his thumbs, and yet, through sheer determination, has become one of the greatest competitors the medium has ever seen. That is the magic of sport. I'm headed towards that bridge. High speed. To Andy Hall. Tyson Fury still the Danish footballer Christian Eriksen suffered a heart attack on field at the last World Cup. His life was threatened and many believed he would do well to regain the ability to walk, let alone come back to football. Returning to his profession would surely be impossible. And yet he returned, joining Brentford, becoming instrumental in the side's chances of climbing the Premier League table. At the European Football Championship in 2016, little old Wales with a population of like six people, max, knocked out tournament favourites Belgium. Sport is the only real life distillation of magic we have left. Too many video game representations hone in on what makes sport lucrative. 
rather than magical. Too many video games are preoccupied with making the most realistic translation of sport possible, but in doing so, they drag in all of the politics, all of the drama, all of the emphasis on real world money. FIFA Football Ultimate Team has always been and always will be the most accurate representation of football and it has nothing to do with the gameplay. But those most willing to undo their purse strings are most likely to win. Success can be bought. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games was unique in this respect. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games understood what made sport beautiful. What made sport magical. Since 2005, Yuji Naka, so-called father of Sonic, and yes, he is indeed so-called so by so many as no one but himself, and the actual father of video games themselves, the iconic Mr. Shigeru at delayed games forever bad, rushed games are bad, all games are bad, f video games, Miyamoto, held under the table backroom poker game talks, firmly in the legally dubious domain of hypothetically speaking pipe dreams, as it were, of Mario, Miyamoto's brainchild, and Sonic, Naka's abducted neighbor, crossing over. This would not materialize, as according to reports, neither could conceive of a consistent world or story to make a crossover anything but jarring. Yes. That, that's, that's why. If, if you take the word at face value, which, uh, come on, you know what I'm not. Mario and Sonic did not cross over until their nebulous Olympic quote-unquote adventures, a setting so obviously detached from the Super Mario reality with a gameplay loop so incredibly straightforward the Mario IP could not be tainted. I believe the excuse of the defense of, of Naka and company that Nintendo were not in favor of a crossover for consistency and circumstantial reasons just as much as I believe that kid from school who often says yes he indeed has a girlfriend but she lives in Australia and I can never see her because all of her cameras are broken and she's allergic to the sun. Time to put the validity of the claim into question and to present my own theories to you. The acting jury per se. Anything to say before we begin? In 2005 Sega were co-developing the latest and also still latest God, that one hurt. F-Zero. F-Zero GX for Nintendo's GameCube. Sega had only just started getting used to sitting on the sidelines sipping orange juice boxes after being unceremoniously dumped at the console race after the Dreamcast's unfortunate and, in truth, entirely unwarranted failure, at least from the perspective of first-party output. They were, however, taking the loss with grace, moving many Dreamcast exclusives like the Sonic Adventure series, the Shenmue series, and eventually even Samba de Amigo to rival consoles. Though, not Sega Bass Fishing 2. Them's just too precious, I guess. Uh, but Sega's stock was still declining. If it weren't for the remarkable generosity of one Isao Okawa, uh, then chairman, forgiving Sega of the astronomical debt they owed to him, and then further offering Sega Corporation every last penny of his $695 million worth of stock, the company would long since have been resigned to existing as a chapter of a textbook on the history of video games and the title of one detailing how to fumble the proverbial bag. But that is not to say that the bag they currently held could not indeed be fumbled. In fact, it is not to say that it was only just about to be. In this post-Dreamcast era, Sega were trying to show the world they could balance perfectly well on both feet, uh, which is something remarkably difficult to do when you're standing on a knife's edge. They subsisted almost solely off of sports games like Sega Soccer, Sega Rally, Sega GT, NBA, NFL, the Virtuous Series, and the like. Second to that were the re-releases. 
the Sega Ages series, of which there were many entries, uh, Sonic re-releases like the Gems Collection and the Mega Collection, and ports of modern classics like Shenmue and Nights into Dreams. They moved most of the Dreamcast's catalogue around as so that they would not be lost to time. Games like Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 found new life on Sony and Nintendo's hardware, eventually coming to the Xbox ecosystem as well. Where new Sega games were concerned, this was hit or miss, and even some of the hits could have been construed as misses in truth. Perhaps the greatest achievement by Sega in this era was the creation of the Monkey Ball series. This is a series that has stood the test of time, and rightfully so, it's remarkable. But that's... that's kind of it for this era. For in-house developers to go from developing for one hardware platform, and crucially a, a very specific hardware platform, to developing for, for three, was quite the ask, one which many simply did not have an answer for. I believe Sonic Heroes is good, but I'm aware many disagree. while also being aware that many really like to exaggerate its strengths. And what's funny is, is that this is entirely down to how Sega completely shit the bed with its release. So let's not talk about its quality, let's talk about how its mishandling is the definitive case study, the prime example of Sega's god-awful management, the main reason anyone would be hesitant to lend their IP to a studio like Sega. First, let's discuss the elephant in the room. How does a team like Sonic Team, one that has already had its fair share of issues when it came to polish, adjust from working on one console to three simultaneously? And to pile more misery on top of that, to manage to build this game and port it three times in less than 20 months? Well, the answer is... they didn't. Yuji Naka led this project, and while I'm hesitant to blame one man, I will simply insert my opinion that as a leader, as a head of a project, it is your entire job to make sure that the budget is allocated well, that you manage deadlines, and that you do not end up forcing your lead level designer to dance along the line between life and death to finish a video game. Naka visionary that he was saw 2003 as the year of Sonic. This entailed a line of Happy Meal toys, it's a new cartoon called Sonic X, and four games. Sonic Battle, Sonic Pinball Party, a remaster of Sonic Adventure with the confusing subtitle of DX Director's Cut, despite as you probably already know the director not even being involved in that. The fourth game was to be Sonic Heroes. Naka saw the arbitrary year of 2003 as crucial to reinstating Sonic's significance among the youth. So much so, that he seemed to care little for Sonic Adventure DX being less definitive than the original, and rushing along production of heroes in particular. In truth, more time in the oven may not have saved battle, it was conceptually flawed to begin with. Not many would be willing to shell out even more cash for a second GBA console, a link cable, and a second copy of the game, just for some wild and wacky multiplayer with Sonic characters. The de facto fighting game experience was on console, because of how straightforward and comparatively inexpensive it would be. Despite how strong the animations and mechanics are in Sonic Battle for a multiplayer experience, they also do not translate to a single player campaign. The gameplay is not good enough to carry you through a lackluster story, and the lackluster story sure isn't good enough to motivate you through hours and hours of rinse repeat gameplay. The hardware limited Sonic Battle's ability to be a good multiplayer game, and the game itself limited itself in its ability to be a strong single player outing. It was dead on arrival. Capping off this quote unquote year of Sonic, capping off 2003, this was the fate Naka assigned to Sonic Heroes. The deadline was arbitrarily strict, and for some godforsaken reason, not allowed. 
to change. There were two gameplay and level designers assigned to this project, Takashi Izuka and because what happened, it wasn't his fault. I'd rather not associate his name under this negative connotation. Izuka, as both director and lead level designer, was living in the United States while the rest of Sonic Team operated out of Japan. First of all, this was bizarre and entirely inefficient. The other aforementioned level designer felt very ill and couldn't work on the project consistently, ultimately dropping out completely. As such, Izuka handled a workload uh, normally given to far more than two people anyway, all by himself. Because he had to. Not to. Because the game had to release. Do I even need to list off the actually infinite number of solutions? Oh. Probably not, seeing as the common denominator for, you know, not letting your lead level designer and director push himself so hard that he lost 22 pounds, not by exercising, but by virtue of not finding time to eat, suffer from insomnia and chronic stress and anxiety would require A, more money, B, risking a need for more time, uh, or C, Caring about your staff. The role via Indeed of the video game producer is to manage staff, manage budget, manage deadlines, and make sure everything is running smoothly. It seems to me that this job description was skim read by Naka, who only saw the word running, because production was indeed running, but at a cost, one which would leak into the final product as it so happened. Welcome to the step-by-step -step guide on how to manage like Sega. Step 1, f*** everything up beyond comprehension. Sonic Team USA partnered with Criterion to use the renderware engine in the hopes of making the porting process easier, and perhaps it did, but it did not by any means make the porting process easy. The game was built for the GameCube with the idea that ports would be based on that version. Most assets from the adventure games would not translate to heroes because of the renderware engine. As such, many of the assets would need to be rebuilt. Finally, the PlayStation 2 version of the game was, and remains, an absolute disaster. Every other version manages to hit 60 frames per second, even if they do not maintain said rate consistently. The PlayStation 2 version barely makes 30 stuttering and coughing all the way to the finish line. There are an abundance of visual glitches, the risk of hard crashes, and an innumerable amount of bugs. Microsoft's Xbox port fares better, and naturally the GameCube port fares best, neither are without significant flaws in said department. Subjectively, many feel the game is padded unnecessarily. There is an objective abundance of recycled content, something that seems obvious as to why in retrospect. Levels are very inconsistent in their quality and are more straightforward than ever before. You can like the game, and I do, but the fact that there is a significant portion of the general population who not only dislike the game, but can give strong objective reasoning as to why points more so to the fact that we who like the game are a little bit blinded by our love to the source material rather than the product itself. The game is flawed, and the who, what, where, and why is obvious. This is fine. Proceeding heroes, Sonic as a series, would plunge into an unfortunate mire that would taint the character's legacy for, well, ever. Sonic was never good. Between 2003 and 2007, there were a variety of entries to the Sonic series, where even the best, most ambitious entries were dragged down by mismanagement and stupid, arbitrary deadlines. Sonic 06 comes to mind as a game that had limitless potential, an excellent creative team, and ambition to boot. And yet, it'll forever be remembered by most, not simply as the worst Sonic game, but perhaps the worst video game in history, to many who see it as, oh, that buggy game from the mid-2000s where Sonic kisses a human. Sonic Chronicles suffered a similar fate, with miscommunication between Bioware and Sega, strict deadlines, and an overall poor management dooming the product to obscurity. Sonic and the Secret Rings failed to ride that Wii motion control frenzy despite being released in the height of the phenomenon. The game was rushed, there was poor communication, and I'm starting to sound like a Shadow the Hedgehog was a failed attempt at making Sonic as a series look cool and grown up. I hesitate to criticise any game's gameplay as bad because it's very subjective, but I personally 
cannot enjoy the moment-to-moment -moment action for even the briefest of said aforementioned moments. The story is stupid, the character depictions are wholly inconsistent, and it is optimized poorly to boot. I do derive a sick, shameful enjoyment from laughing at how poorly thought out disgusting black creatures get out of my sight and just plain lame where's that damn fourth chaos emerald the dialogue can be but that's a retrospective admiration that i'll not credit the team for because that was just not their goal and service has always been the double-edged sword presenting itself as somewhat of a thorn in the side of sonic team the entire premise of heroes was founded on the criticism that there were not enough playable characters in previous entries shadow the hedgehog was created to placate fans who craved a darker tone combine both criticisms and you get sonic 06 where leadership and mismanagement plagued and sega as a company did not need that kind of bad press. Multiple Sonic games per year would hit store shelves with most of them feeling somewhat lackluster. So can you really blame Nintendo for not wanting to loan Sega their golden goose, their Mickey Mouse, their most treasured IP, Super Mario? Especially after they saw what Sega did to theirs. The fact that his transition to 3D was far less. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Sonic There's one thing you should know about Sonic and Luigi before spending your hard earned money on it. It's a big piece of garbage. Mm -hmm. The excuse given to us for the lack of any crossover between the two series despite under the table talks in 2005 is that a consistent setting was never found, but I find that excuse to be wholly transparent. Super Mario at this point in the early 2000s had featured in many a crossover. The obvious example is Super Smash Bros. 64, and Melee and soon to be Brawl, with Solid Snake already having been revealed in a pre-Mario and Sonic crossover world at E3 2006. Even considering that days being close enough to when the game would have been revealed, one must remember that the agreement to feature Snake would have been in place a year if not more before then. Solid Snake crossing over with Mario is absolutely more strange than a crossover with Sonic and one where Mario looks like this and fights with intent to kill? Forget about it. Even get a funny kind of forget about it, like the New York. Beyond Smash Bros, Mario featured in NBA Street in 2005. He crossed over with Final Fantasy to play basketball in 2006. He went go-karting with Pac-Man in 2005. He played Monopoly with Dragon Quest characters in Itadaki Street in 2007. He went snowboarding with Mac, Elise and company in SSX on tour in 2005. And finally, Bomberman featured in Wario's spin-off Wario Blast in 1994, and these are all just games released before Mario and Sonic hit the Olympic running track. Even if one argued that the issue was the handling of the Mario IP by another studio, then I'd posit that given the right studio, then Nintendo were more than happy to loan out the rights. Super Mario RPG, for example, was handled by Square Enix, Mario Party by a variety of different studios including Hudson Soft and Capcom, neither of which were affiliated with Nintendo. The Mario and Luigi series was handled by Alpha Dream, also unaffiliated with Nintendo. Mario Tennis was handled by Camelot and finally, most significantly, Nintendo's highest grossing series of all time, Mario Kart was developed not once, not twice, but three times for arcade cabinets by Namco. In the years after, Nintendo have allowed Ubisoft to handle their precious Super Mario IP in a crossover with the raving f***ing rabbits in a tactical XCOM shooter. Donkey Kong and Bowser have been in Skylanders. Mario has continued to feature in Dragon Quest board game crossovers like Fortune Street and Puzzle and Dragons, and most bizarrely of all, has references in Captain Rainbow. To reiterate, Sonic had never and has never crossed over with Mario because a, quote, consistent setting and style could not be found that would make sense." End quote. In the year of our Lord 2022, 
Sonic has still not crossed over with Super Mario, not including Smash Brothers in anything other than their Olympic escapades. And without jumping the gun, those escapades look to have long since ended. I believe Nintendo saw Sega incompetent to wield the Mario IP. I believe Nintendo saw the Sonic series as a poisoned chalice that would taint Super Mario's squeaky clean legacy, or quite possibly that there at that point remained a not so underlying pride among the leaders of Kyoto's crown jewel, one that prohibited them from collaborating with a once sworn enemy. Perhaps, and, and yes, that, that implies conjecture, but hu humor me. Perhaps the folk at Nintendo liked that Sega had to come begging to them, begging to publish their Sonic games and their hardware. Perhaps Nintendo liked that ego trip, that pride and arrogance, reinforced by Sega vigorously devouring their table scraps, the likes of F-Zero, as if they were being given a 5 star 3 course meal. Maybe. Maybe. But what is certain? is that Miyamoto was humoring Naka back in 2005. There were no plans for a Mario and Sonic crossover. Because what could Nintendo possibly gain? What possible advantage would there be to a Mario and Sonic crossover for Nintendo? The only benefactor in this hypothetical partnership would be Sega, for whom it would be a much needed boom. It was never going to happen. It was never going to happen. But it did. On March 28th of 2007, Sega and Nintendo released a joint statement to the press confirming that the project was real and would be releasing by the end of the year. So what gives? Sega nabbed the video game rights to Beijing's 2008 Olympic Games and approached Nintendo at an undisclosed time, asking for permission to use the Super Mario IP in a Sonic-themed Olympics video game. A Sonic and Mario at the Olympic Games, as it were. Nintendo agreed. But, but why? Well, firstly, money. But in a manner far more relevant, Sega had propositioned an opportunity that was mutually beneficial. As far as crossovers go, this was the perfect idea to placate Nintendo. Because this crossover offered something that nothing else could. Firstly, and arguably most importantly, it's not important at all. It offered a static, consistent environment where there would be no need to explain canon or the like. This was 
obviously, at Olympic Games, this setting was obviously detached from reality, a nebulous null space where anything could happen. Not exactly in setting because dream events took place in specific Mario and Sonic locations, but rather an excuse to allow these characters and settings to merge without intruding on the canon of either. The suspension of disbelief necessary to watch Knuckles throw Javelin against Bowser allows for one to nonchalantly watch Mario and Sonic fence against each other on a seaside hill lookalike level called Dual Wharf Beach without passing out from confusion or worse, logging onto a message board to question the canonicity. Second of all, the game was positioned as a minigame collection, a casual multiplayer game. This was very attractive to Nintendo. The appetite for party games, especially sports-centric party games, was higher than ever, with Nintendo themselves hot off the heels with Wii Sports. This game would doubtlessly reach a large audience, and the effect could only be positive because of how difficult it would be to ruin a motion-controlled minigame collection. Ironic. The game would be simple, it would be casual, it would be straightforward. Even if Nintendo did not trust Sega with their IP in an action setting, it'd be very, very, very difficult to f*** up an Olympics-based minigame collection, especially with Sega agreeing to let Nintendo supervise development. This would be a financial boost where the risk of damage to their image was insignificant for how impossible the game would be to ruin. Finally, and certainly, most significantly, this was the goddamned Olympics we're talking about. The world's most recognized sporting event. The opportunity to have your mascot, a mascot you would like to become as ubiquitous as Mickey Mouse, representing the Olympics. The world's most watched, most recognized, most hyped, most sport fever inducing event is too good to pass up whoever you are. In 2007, Mario was a character for sure and a recognizable one at that, but he wasn't as ubiquitous as he is today. Hell, when I was a kid, I used to call Mario the Red Gnome from SugarFreeGames.com before we were allowed a Nintendo console. Today, Mario is arguably more recognizable than Mickey Mouse, a character who almost solely exists to sell Disneyland merch at this point. Competing in the officially sanctioned Olympics, exclusively competing in the video game space at that, would be very very significant and would legitimize Super Mario's ensemble cast as bona fide icons. For Sega, while they could have let Sonic compete on his own, having him stand alongside Mario would legitimize Sonic as his equal. This would be massive, as the last couple years would suggest that he was not, and the character needed a win after the knock. That's, that's, an, that's an understatement, I'm gonna just hold on a sec. After the wholehearted, knee-capping, spine-removing, brain contusion inducing battering his image took after Sonic 06, to reassert his status as a video game icon and then to insert himself as a global icon in one fell swoop would be remarkable. All thanks to him sharing center stage with an irrefutable icon. An icon bursting with ever bright rays of pure white light. An icon shining from a beacon of quality. Mr. Pianta. He's only ever been in genre definers. As much as I love Sonic, everything I have just said about his relevancy is rooted in cold, unbiased, unemotional, researched observation. It pains me to say it, but without Mario headlining alongside Sonic, the boon of the Olympics license would be a hit or miss cool thing. It would more than likely have been wholly unremarkable and forgettable. But having Mario there, having that crossover there, having the two of them being equals, elevated both icons 100 fold. A rising tide raises all boats, and in this case, even though one boat was manned by a captain with a reference sheet that read They were sailing for about 100 meters in still water. Chances of a shipwreck were sub-zero. And this is before considering the significance of the crossover to already established fans. Fans had been pining for a crossover for decades, none of which had any relation to the aforementioned corporate interest. It would have been, quite simply, 
legendary. That crossover would be the ultimate symbol of unity, two rivals who'd been at each other's throats for decades at this point, throwing down their weapons to settle things like gentlemen, like good sports. And it happened and something special was born. Mario and Sonic crossed over, competing in a variety of different sporting events, injecting their personality and flair into a century-spanning sporting saga. And yet, while it was indeed legendary, it was only so sporadically. Its legend, its legacy, will forever be marred, because somewhere along the way, they forgot or were perhaps asked to forget. It was never the license that made the series special. It was never the sports, the competition, the gameplay, the winning, the losing. It was never what they thought, or perhaps even what we thought. No, it was the thread sewn between. It was the soul. The cracks that once were so have grown, splintered off, and now there is nothing but the void the cracks left behind. And where those cracks have torn its image asunder, ours is just starting to take shape. To understand why, to understand how, perhaps I should show you that it did, it was, and it had soul. Perhaps I should show you. In trying to differentiate between success and failure, we have to look at what the team behind the project was actually trying to achieve. Fortunately for us, the mission statement presented to Sega was also presented to us. In retrospect, on Sega's part and on the Olympic Committee's part, this was somewhat foolish. This gives us an objective measuring stick to gauge success with irrefutable results. To understand what makes a bad Mario and Sonic, to understand who prowls around strolling the streets in its hollow soul-sucked corpse, understand the who, where and why, we must definitively prove that, yes, once upon a time it was beautiful. We must know how it was so memorable, so unique, so special, oh so long ago. What was Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games trying to be? What makes a good Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games? How did they capture that elusive, intangible, unquantifiable magic? Well, you see, it isn't as unquantifiable as you might think it is. As presented by the teams behind the project, the goals were straightforward and each wove back to the one core central belief presented in the first chapter of this dossier. The soul, the essence of what sport should be, what it was, and what so many have forgotten it to be. Sport is... it's, it's beautiful. It, it unites enemies. It offers a level playing field, a, a meritocracy, a platform where dedication is rewarded, not exploited. A platform to tell a story, to represent more than yours. To express, to, to belong, to bask in the glory and victory and to share a consolatory, mutual kind of mourning, a, a sadness in loss. To feel an unadulterated joy, a joy one can only feel because of how rare, how fleeting, how easily it could have been taken away it was. To glimpse real, honest to God, true to life. Magic. That is what the Olympics should be, and that is what this series set out to represent. So, so then what was the mission statement for this series? What did they want to achieve? One, get kids interested in the Olympics using fun, lovable, already recognizable mascots. Two, promote the idea of the good sport, being competitive while staying amicable. Three, offer an avenue for Sonic fans to appreciate Super Mario and vice versa. Four, give some fan service to longtime fans of the two mascots, give them a, a platform to bask in the sheer coolness of the two rivals sharing a podium. I'm talking novelty, characters, fan service, easter eggs and personality. Uh, the charm is crucial. 
uh, five capture that childlike whimsy, magic and joy that the two characters routinely capture in their individual adventures. That the fantasy and magic of sports extends to actual literal magic. This means flying around in Yoshi's Island, skating through Bowser's castle or defeating chaos using figure eight skating. The same way Sonic made a generation of kids think running was cool, Mario and Sonic need to show the human magic of sports along with the literal magic seen in Mario and Sonic related media. In achieving these goals, the genre essentially chose itself. The game would need to be easy, casual, party game, fun. As such, each goal could be met with ease. How would making a hyper competitive sweat fest promote these ideals? Many have to and will continue to chastise the series as dull, a far too easy casual game with controls that utilise less buttons and a light switch. But that was exactly the point, and its status as such remains crucial to promoting exactly what makes this series so special, so unique, so magical. This was designed as a casual game, a party game, not a competitive game. Gameplay depth is a must, but if you make a casual game, a sports game too deep, then the player will drown. There's a scale between Mario Party, Mario Kart and Street Fighter. Why ask Mario and Sonic, a game with kid-friendly mascots, to match the gameplay depth of a game designed for a super fan of the sport? Think of the consumer. If you buy NHL, you're a hardcore hockey fan. If you buy NBA 2K, you're a hardcore basketball fan. If you buy FIFA, you're no doubt a blackjack enthusiast. If you buy Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, you are a Mario and Sonic fan first and foremost. Possibly with an interest in sports, maybe with an interest in the Olympics. But it is beyond doubt that you love Mario and Sonic as characters first. Perhaps you don't know the characters by name per se, but you're drawn in by the happy-go-lucky attitude they exude on the cover art, thus signifying that there's nothing hardcore about this experience. This will just be a good time, plain and simple. It is the game's job to cultivate a love of sport next. Hardcore gymnastic enthusiasts looking for a hardcore, realistic, deep representation of gymnastics are not going to buy a Mario and Sonic spin-off of the Olympics. And even if they do, there is not a chance in hell that they're getting duped into a casual experience. That's on them. In summation, from the horse's mouth, Mario and Sonic's mission statement is to make a casual game to get young people and video game players interested in the Olympics. It is to fulfil that childlike fantasy of two sworn rivals sharing a podium and leaving in good grace. It is to provide the fans with that all-important fan service, these nods and touches and easter eggs that'll make any fan of a retrospective series chuckle. Sport is about the little guy landing the impossible block against a towering giant. It is the beauty of the miracle. The perfect Mario and Sonic Olympic experience has characters and personality in spades. We'll get to this when the time comes, but you can probably already see that story mode is going to be crucial to fulfill that. It would have enough depth to be engaging, enough depth so that you're tempted to hit replay to get a better score, but not so much depth that the most practiced player will always win without fail. Uh, not so much that it erodes the magic of the miracle. Get those uninterested in the Olympics interested, introduce Sonic fans to the world and character roster of Super Mario and vice versa, give the Olympics a representation using fun, lovable, whimsical cartoon characters, and also, finally, to provide fan service and easter eggs. Most importantly, it needs to be fun. So with these laboratory tested, scientifically accurate, chemically sound set of guidelines, this word for word breakdown straight from the horse's mouth detailing the genetic makeup of the soul of Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, allow me to pull back the curtain, revealing exactly what happened to stain what should have been remarkable, taint what was a perfect formula, in pursuit of something so far from that.
What does Coca-Cola taste like? No, like... Like, seriously, like, I actually am asking you, uh, what does... What does Coca-Cola taste like? It tastes, it tastes like syrup. It just tastes, it just tastes like syrup. The answer is you don't know because it doesn't taste like anything. Um, technically, Coca-Cola tastes like syrup. Um, and if I'm being honest, uh, Coca-Cola tastes uh, like shit. <laughs> See, children love Coca-Cola, and when you were younger, you loved Coca-Cola because it is sugary and sweet. It is easy to appreciate for the simple palate of a child. But what makes Coca-Cola so special today to us, so remarkably desirable, so amazing, is that when you're a kid, when it hits its hardest, you can't have it. As such, it holds a status to a kid as something to savor. So look forward to that fizz pop being the auditory confirmation you are in for a blissful few minutes of complete and utter luxury. You don't get coke often, so when you do, it just hits different. Nowadays, and I'd argue this applies even if you still love Coca-Cola, you think back and wonder why you ever craved Coca-Cola so desperately. But you forget that back then it wasn't as simple as just walking into the shop across the road. That black and red bottle was prestigious. The quintessential treat. It was that scarcity, that prestige, that made Coca-Cola so remarkably special. And even if you enjoy Coca-Cola as an adult, it is inarguable that when you were younger it was far more special. Mario and Sonic at the Olympics 2008 is Coca-Cola. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games 2008, uh, like Coca-Cola, is not that good in retrospect without context. For example, Super Mario Odyssey 2017, to my mind, is far better than Super Mario 64 1996, and yet many, myself included, are more scathing in their criticism in regards to 2017's outing. Uh, this is because by nature, we downplay, not exactly forgive, but downplay the flaws of the original because, well, it was the original. There is an inherent charm there, even if you, like me, were not alive when that mattered. They had no feedback to work from. They were swinging on the first inning with a new bat in their opposite hand with a pitcher they'd never seen before in their lives. Super Mario 64 is worse, but it is also just about as good as Odyssey on balance, because the criticisms you give to Super Mario Odyssey while still relevant to 64 cannot be applied as harshly. Old games are not immune from criticism, but they are significantly less vulnerable to criticism by the nature of them being the first try. We let things slide. Obsy 3D will always be bad, mind you, because it was bad back then, but Super Mario 1, Pac-Man, Tetris and the like will always be excellent because they are inherently fun to play, despite their simplicity, their lack of narrative context, the absence of artistic panache, all of the modern framing or gameplay techniques that have turned video games from toys into to art. Because context matters. We don't call cavemen stupid because they lit fire with rocks and sticks when we can just use a lighter. This is why Sunshine 64's follow-up is seen as the worst entry in the series uh, when it's actually the best. Despite the fact that it improves the formula in many ways, we didn't and don't let things slide as easily the next time around. Many bemoan this attitude saying we should just judge everything the same, but in truth, this is a topic of discussion for another day. This is a significant grey area in artistic criticism where we all just have our own ways of coming to our own conclusions, but in this context, we are not exactly criticizing the art itself. Because the way I see this entry and the way I see this series is entirely down to one thing and one thing only. The heart, the soul, 
the passion of the team behind it. As we go on, it starts to become very, very obvious when and where the team decided to check out. Certainly, there will be many specific things I excuse this entry for, specific things I absolutely will not excuse in later entries, despite the issue in question remaining the exact same. Because as previously mentioned, context is crucial. The flaws of this game are only flaws because they did not realize they were flaws that had solutions. Later games do not have that luxury. Imagine there had never been another crossover between Mario and Sonic afterwards. Imagine the series wasn't pushed into an early grave by the cynical scythe of capitalism. All of a sudden, the original 2008 entry seems far more significant because it was significant. It was a massive deal in 2008. For sure, in the year of our Lord, 2022, with a couple entries in the series under our belt, the novelty has likely worn off, but I'm here to recontextualize that belief. If I'm going to speak purely objectively, removing context, then this is, without a doubt, one of the weakest entries in the series, uh, but for an entirely different, more understandable reason. It was an innocent naivety rather than a jaded corporate capitalistic sabotage. This was the warm-up lap, and as anyone who likes Formula 1 knows, you almost always do best on the final laps once you're acquainted with the conditions. This was Sega's first stab at a whole new series, at capturing a whole new audience, at fulfilling a strict set of goals through the video game medium, and you know what? Just because they did it better the next time around does not mean that this try was bad. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games Beijing 2008 laid the groundwork for the entire series. Something objectively commendable and something that later games, games who tore up that foundation, would rightfully be chastised for. Mario and Sonic 2008 released on the Wii and DS simultaneously, both featuring the most perfect format imaginable. The game would not truly be a game, but rather a hub for the player to select a variety of mini-games a la Wii Sports. There would be a selection of Olympic mainstays, athletics, aquatics, gymnastics and the like, and then a second sub-section, the extra special X Factor, the Dream Events. <laughs> Dream events are conceptually genius. Take events we are familiar with as humans and remix the sh** out of them until they are completely unrecognizable. The beauty of dream events are that they successfully tick every checkbox on the mission statement. While sports are inherently magical, dream events take sports and show the kid a magical reinterpretation while nonetheless keeping the heart of the original sporting event. Dream events allow talented developers to throw the shackles loose, express themselves and the characters we all know and love. Like previously mentioned, entries in this series live or die based on their charm, personality, and magic. Hypothetically, if 2008's entry were the fifth or sixth entry in the series, I would be far, far harsher. I would unequivocally declare it the de facto worst game in the series, but I can't do that because I far too vividly remember unboxing it on Christmas morning and laughing so hard, I snorted out Alpro soya milk when Knuckles seemed to question all of his life's choices after losing at hammer throw to Yoshi from Super Fu- <laughs> Mario. Mario and Sonic 2008 has an advantage no other game in the series has. It was the first. As such, the magic did not even really need to be captured or conjured or caught in a bottle because it was already there. I guarantee that if today's internet culture existed back then, Mario and Sonic 2008 would have been memed to high heaven. It would have become the definitive drinking slash get drunk game because it was ridiculous in the same way games like Fortnite and multiverses are today. Because it wasn't simply ridiculous from its outward appearance, um, Mario and Sonic 2008 was an absolute gimmick fest and I unironically, sincerely, wholeheartedly wouldn't have it any other way at all. Think back to the egg and spoon race analogy. Everybody has their own conspiratorial secret technique that always guarantees a win. There are an infinite number of ways to run a real life race, but in a video game, more often than not, your options are, are very far from being infinite. The fact of the matter is, is that video games are not limited by human ability or ingenuity, but by how big the box is that you're placed in by the designer. Super Mario Bros. 1 players, for example, have already faced the human limit. Hell, they've just faced the limit end of. There is a de facto best way to beat the game fast and that's that. In most 
video games, there is, put simply, the correct way to do something. In every multiplayer game, there is a weapon meta. Meta. Jesus fucking Christ, that one's up there for sure. In every multiplayer game, there is a weapon meta. Bingo. These are the best ones. You will win if you use them. You will lose if you use the worst ones. If two equally skilled players match up against each other and one of the players is using a lower ranked weapon or fighter within the meta, they will lose. For sure, certainly, right? Players of a certain caliber can win if they use bad weapons, but only if the quality of their opponent will allow it. This is great, by the way. I love fighting games, watching more so than playing, because I am, quite frankly, straight ass. But is there not something beautiful about a game that cannot be definitively learned? A game without a meta. A game where every single player who ever picks up a controller has their own way to win, their own technique, their own secret sauce to winning every single time. A game where even though your friend is equally as certain that his technique is better than yours, you still believe he is wrong and you will win because your ace up your sleeve is just a better ace. This is why I love Wii Sports. It is why I adore Mario sports games, especially Mario Tennis Aces. You are all collectively sleeping on a modern classic and it is actually getting hilarious. And it is, of course, why I will always treasure Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. Or at least most of them. Let me show you what I mean. I think this is going to be the ragdoll Scott Joplin theme. I'm just going to put on Scott Joplin piano right now. This is 100 meter sprint. Some say this is the most phoned in, least interesting, most simple minigame ever created in the history of anything ever. I say that some people have only played this minigame one time on their own or with someone as dry as the fucking sand dunes because this minigame right here is unironically golden and here's why. The rules are simple. Come first or face eternal damnation. Come first or accept your position as a beta for life. Come first or be known as the village loser. Bingo. The stakes are high. Do you really want to be known as the guy who came third in 100 meter race? Of course not. Now the controls are simple. Shake. That's all you have to do. Shake. Just... Shake. Correct, dear audience, for by restricting the player to how fast they can move a controller in real life, Sega have cursed the player with an infinite number of options. These are our four case studies for today. Meet Jocelyn, Caucasian, female, 21. Jocelyn swings the Wii Remote using the full extension of the arm. She swears it works, but only for those with experience in intense contact sport with an efficiency in arm rotation. Third, we have Uncle Dave. Uh, age 45, male Caucasian. Uh, interestingly, Dave chooses to use an elbow-based rotation for a balance of the two. Uh, the catch is that only a select few can master this skill, exclusively those who have built up rotational strength from years of recreation. Finally, we have the embodiment of chaos. Curtis, 23, Middle Eastern descent, male. This wild card balances the Wii remote on an armrest, horizontally of course, before rocking it like a boat. The results are mixed, but if pulled off, nothing else stands even the slightest chance whatsoever. Do you see what I mean? And these are just the three we could get to sign on um, with, of course, with Uncle Dave uh, rounding out the trio. But, you know, I, th I think I'll take my chances with him. I imagine he'll find it tricky to kind of get the, the spelling part of the season to assist letter down. Gimmicks are vague and abstract and as such so is the meta. For a party game that is just beautiful, no matter who you play with or where, everyone will have their own way of playing the game. Nobody else's way is right because everybody is convinced that theirs is. That is beautiful. That is sport. That is the soul of Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. Most minigames follow a similar template. Charge up by shaking, time a button press, and then follow a vague motion controlled guideline to win. But none can be the same because it is the manner in which you shake that is 
always different. The way you swing to run is different to the way you swing to trampoline jump, to swim, to swing a table, tennis, racket, the input button per se is the same, but the power of the motion is that every intricacy of the button press is entirely customizable by you. For the aforementioned reasons, most of the minigames are by nature fun. But this non-linear control scheme does not work at all in fencing and table tennis. Unfortunately, by their very nature, these events do not translate to the non-linear controls the devs set in their aim to make the game party friendly and replayable, because in real life, these games are pretty f***ing linear. There's a way to hold a tennis racket, it isn't subjective. Fencing and table tennis are one versus one inherently competitive and tactical sports in real life. Controls are just too loose in table tennis. It never truly feels like you're in control. Perhaps the tuning was so loose to accommodate a variety of stances, but I feel Sega should have just put their foot down and said, no, this is going to need to be more linear here instead of whatever they chose to do instead. Yes, accurate simulation is dull and not the point at all of this series, but you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It is possible to hit a happy medium between accurate table tennis and the, the nothingness of what they included. It is not all or nothing. Just because your game is party friendly and allows for a variety of stances does not mean you are excused from lackluster motion implementation. Sometimes you just need a definitive stance. In Wii Sports, for example, you have got to hold the Wii Remote like a tennis racket or golf club or else you just will lose. Trying to accommodate someone who doesn't want to take an accurate stance, trying to accommodate someone who doesn't care enough to try hard enough to focus is just bad design. There's a happy medium between hyper-realistic sim and do whatever LMAO. That medium is being accurate enough not to make those who are trying to play the game like a real-life version with an accurate stance and technique want to get to the answer. The perfect template in this scenario, as is the case with most scenarios, is Wii Sports. Not too realistic to lock off newcomers, but realistic enough that you feel like you are in control of the situation. Motion controls are only bad when they are not an alternative, rather a scheme that makes you feel out of control. Like no matter what you do, what stance you take, however much you try to emulate the real life technique, the outcome is up to God to decide. Luckily, this out of control frustration is present only twice, in fencing and table tennis. Unfortunately, table tennis is also one of the dream events, something that is unfortunate because of how few dream events there are in the first place. It would be fine if table tennis sucked because it was an afterthought, just don't play it, but it's one quarter of the dream events. You'd think they'd have focused harder on making it tolerable. Even without Wii Motion Plus, Wii Play managed some pretty damn good table tennis. This is just bizarre. Why choose your weakest event to be one of four dream events? The other three are Dream Race, Dream Platform, and Dream Fencing. With fencing, I can see why it was selected. It was the only combat sport, and let's face it, most of us care more about who would win in a fight between Mario and Sonic over who would win in a swimming tourney. It makes sense to be reinterpreted as a dream event, but I just wish they'd put more time into refining the chord loop, because as is, fencing, to my mind, is the second weakest event. Much like table tennis, it is inherently complicated in real life with an objectively correct stance. Fencing and table tennis are inherently reactive sports, but with fencing it is again a fight. As such, it is tactical. Phoning in an event and passing it off as casual fun doesn't work if the sport is tactical and, if we're being honest, can't really be interpreted in a casual way without losing the essence of what it actually stands for. Sword fighting, like in Wii Sports, um, and fencing are two completely different things. It is your job as a designer to find a way to dumb down the sport in a way that doesn't compromise its integrity. They did not do that this time. Like table tennis, they just took the framework of the IRL sport and dumbed the controls down and, and nothing else. To reiterate, there was no dumbing down of anything except the controls. The sport remained intact. As such, you just feel out of control.
an example of casual efficacy done well, see Wii Sports Boxing. I don't think I'm good enough at boxing to make my own. Boxing is without a doubt the most complicated sport on God's green earth. A boxer must focus on their footwork, making sure they can evade a punch at any time while also taking a strong defensive stance. While maintaining this defense, they must also make sure that at any second they can also break forward and land a hit on their opponent, all the while making sure that it isn't a trap. They must be alert, knowing when to strike, how many times, when to fake, when their opponent is faking, and they have to do all of this bathing in a concoction of blood and sweat, their head throbbing, not just from being smacked repeatedly in the head, but from all of the orders being shouted from the sidelines. This is without taking regular human mental pressure and performance anxiety into the mix. There can be up to 12 rounds in a professional match, meaning each boxer must strategically conserve stamina and play to their own strengths, while limiting the other's strengths. Boxing is about physical attack, physical defense, and the second metaphysical mind game you play with your opponent. Wii Sports took this complex sport gave you simple controls, but also dumbed down the sport itself while keeping its essence. You control your character from behind, and both arms are controlled independently with a remote and nunchuck. Footwork is too complicated to implement, so it was just removed. The AI does that for you, based on where your opponent moves and which way you dodge. You can move both arms to dodge, you lift them to block, and you swing them to punch. Those are your three moves. Attack, defend, dodge. Attack with a swing punch, defend by lifting your arm. Mind games are about making your opponent dodge or learning which arm is their dominant. The matches are three rounds, so there's no stamina preservation or much tactical thought beyond the moment to moment dodging that tricks you into thinking that the game is tactical. The minigame is simple, but it keeps the three core pillars of the sport. It feels like a simulation, even though it is anything but realistic. Boxing in Wii Sports is so easy, something that is in stark contrast to real boxing. And yet, you always feel the intensity of a real boxing match while also staying in control all the time. Because it is not just the controls that were simplified, it was the entire structure, the DNA construct of the sport. They then had the ingenuity to implement a control scheme that would allow the player to feel in control. Imagine if the game was played in a 2D side-to-side -side perspective. Imagine if it was top-down. Imagine if you could only use one arm at a time. Or worse, you had to use both arms with one Wii Remote. Imagine you had to press a button to switch which arm you were using, or, or worse than all of that, imagine you had to swap the hand you were holding the Wiimote with so the game could interpret the change of angle. You'd feel so out of control. And that is how I feel when playing fencing and table tennis, so it does indeed suck that they make up half of the dream events. I can, however, understand why fencing is present, and in truth, the fact that it is not very fun it actually doesn't really matter at all. In the year 2008, this was the only way to pit Mario against Sonic in a bloodthirsty fight to the death. Nowadays, we have Smash Brothers and the other Olympic Games, but back then, the fact that this was combat was enough to carry the event for a child like me. Luckily, however, Dream Platform and Dream Race are just the best things ever. Not only does the fantasy, the spectacle carry these games, but materially, that spectacle is built upon by responsive, well-controlled gameplay. And in truth, that kind of sums up this entry in its entirety. It feels like a proof of concept more than anything else. This rings true for the DS version too. The gameplay itself is solid by a couple of events and the foundational structure of the game is genius. But it still feels distinctly like the first inning, like the team are trying to sound out the market and what they needed to do. Touch controls like motion controls are massively fun, but nonetheless less so. Once again, to achieve a non-linear control scheme, motion would always be superior. The S's highs are shared by the Wii version, but so are the lows. The minigames are excellent, and I'd argue that the dream events are far superior in the DS version, especially table tennis, which in this version of the game is actually a favourite of mine. Both are the perfect intertwining of two separate fantasies, that of the magic of sport and that of the inherent magic of Mario and Sonic. It realises that spectacle, but only by default because of how badly we wanted these games in the first place. The facts are that these games did not need to be good. They could have been pretty awful, but they would have still been enrapturing. For younger folk especially, this was a chance to see Mario and Sonic, two icons, share a screen, hell, share a racetrack. That was enough. Without context, 
these entries are relatively mid. They are solid C pluses. The flaws in this game are not flaws for a lack of trying. These are the flaws present in a director still trying to find his voice, a series trying to carve a niche and a team still figuring out how to make something special. There is a spirit in this game, all despite what it lacks in flair. It is somewhat safe. Hell, you can tell that by the soundtrack alone. I mean, the theme itself just screams. Default. theme is a MIDI construction, clearly supposed to sound like a grand chorus of brass, but it just sounds so uncanny, it just sounds fake. The piece's progression can be split into four different sections, where the first three are repeats and the final section takes the familiar progression of the first three and flips it for effect. Except there is no effect. Because this is torture music, it is repetitive, it is boring, it is uncanny, it is just this on loop forever, it doesn't change, it is so, so primitive. And though the game itself could be described as primitive, I would forgive it for being so. When you're going as wild, as wacky as sticking Mario and Sonic into an Olympic tournament, you could be forgiven for wanting to recenter, to play it as safe as possible, at risk of alienating a fanbase you have yet to even really create. This entry is tentative, shy, but nonetheless magical because of how it expertly balances sporting fantasy with actual video game fantasy. I would certainly argue that on balance the video game play itself is great. The gameplay is engaging, especially in group settings where the stakes create themselves. And while the characters are personified well in animation and through intermittent voice clips, there is something missing here, even taking dream events into consideration. The world. Story. A narrative or contextual thread tying it all together. Because as is, this is a minigame collection. A fun one, a hilarious one. But it is just minigames. Where is Dream Table Tennis taking place? Where is Dream Fencing? Hell, in the main events, what suggests that this game is taking place in Beijing? The main menu itself feels like a DVD chapter select screen, except each chapter has nothing to do with any of the other chapters. The minigames are fantastic, the motion controls are by and large perfect to my mind, and structurally everything is sound. The foundations were excellent. But without a place, without a setting, without a world feel, oftentimes this game feels like an officially sanctioned Newgrounds project. And while that was just what the Doctor ordered in 2008, I blame no one for not wanting to revisit it in the modern age. While the bread, per se, of this experience is excellent, you cannot ever achieve greatness in an industry surrounded by sandwiches if you deliberately choose not to even try to use a filling. As such, the game, while fun, while remarkable at the time, will probably just be relegated to a fond memory to most, never really creating a compulsion to revisit. The first of anything will always be loved more often than not out of gratitude for laying the groundwork of what would come next. And in this specific case, this is absolutely... 100% accurate. Mario and Sonic at the Winter 2010 game created an entire new subseries. It kept the bones, the foundation of 2008's entry, while changing basically everything to match the winter setting. It was exactly that that defined Winter 2010. It needed to justify its existence as a winter spin-off, and as such it went the extra mile to create a, a snow-capped world of one. It felt real. It felt distinct. Justification of existence was not necessary in 2008. It absolutely was in 2010. And, and as such, 2010 was brimming with, with character charm, personality, and flavour. While Winter 2010 was a turning point in this series, this specific dossier is, is not focused 
from that on the Winter series, but presumably I don't need to tell you. Sega decided not simply to create a fun minigame collection, but a platform brimming with ambition. A platform where the soul, the spirit of Mario and Sonic playing sports together would shine. I'd like you to imagine a game with all the excellent non-linear control of Mario and Sonic 2008, with better visuals, a better selection of minigames, more dream events, but absolutely, crucially, absolutely, unbelievably importantly, imagine Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games with characters personality, excellent context, and a definitive world. I'm just going to come right out and say it at the start here. Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games is the definitive Mario and Sonic summer interpretation. And it all comes down to that beautiful subversive subtitle, because it is everything. This is the London Games, and you feel that right from the get-go. You hear that what you're listening to right now is what every kid in 2012 heard booting up that disc for the first time. But this is pomp. This is confidence. There is nothing half-hearted, nothing default, nothing safe about this theme. This is personality-driven. And when you get to the main menu, the theme becomes... It becomes Eurobeast. Weird choice, but I vibe with it anyway. Um, editor's note, playing it back, I really don't think it can be classified as Eurobeat because uh, there isn't the presence of the, the, the kind of vocal chorus as well as the, the instrumental chorus and arguably it's not fast enough, like it's not high energy enough to be, uh, to qualify for it Italian high energy disco music. I would say it probably has more in common with, with electronic dance music, um, maybe kind of, almost kind of a, a techno for kids vibe. Um, but I would say I am actually wrong here, and uh, no, it is it is not Eurobeat. Uh, I don't think, but that doesn't change uh, how much of a banger this particular track is. Compare this theme to the original. The original theme was the composition team trying to evoke that kind of Olympic spirit. It was like the little brother lying to impress the big kids. This, this theme, this theme is the moment when the little brother decides to put on a turkey mode because he realizes that no, there is no obligation for him to look up to the big kids. And you know what? He himself has got talent. He's got a personality. He's a bona fide f***ing superstar. It's about time that they looked up to him. This is it. This London 2012. This is the Olympic vision presented in 2008. They, they, they achieved it right here. This is the moment Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games 2008 stopped being a cool idea and started just being really cool. But to say 2012 was the moment the tide shifted would be to discredit two modern video game visionaries, two mainstays of Sega and the Sonic team you are no doubt familiar with because they did something special. That happened in 2010. The men responsible for shifting that tide, for, for boiling the essence of the series down um, to its purest, its purest form, those two visionaries were uh, Takashi Izuka and Shun Nakamura. That there, that's, uh, that's Aigo Kasahara. Kasahara is a Sega veteran, someone whose very first credit goes uh, all the way back to 1992, where Kashihara worked on the Irem Skins game. This is a multiplayer golf game for up to four players. Game, while primitive, admittedly, uh, from what I've seen, reviewed well at the time. It'd be too early to say this was Kashihara's calling, per se, uh, as a sports game designer, but it was doubtlessly true that he had done well with the Irem Skins sports game. His next credit would be in 1993 with Rocky Rodent, a very straightforward six-level platformer. Um, I've been sitting here trying to mince my words. I'm going to make the executive decision not to. Uh, the game is shit. The game reviewed badly, and I think it is. I think it's. I think it's not a good game. Even regardless of how Rocky Rodent has aged, uh, the narrative thread presented is it's it's it's, it's non-existent. Um, it doesn't adequately feel the adventure. It is overtly complex for what it wants to be. 
uh, and is entirely unrelatable. Super Mario's plot is straightforward, for example, uh, but that was a good thing. It was relatable, it was easy to understand, and acted as a strong motivation for the player. In, in Rocky Rodent, via Wikipedia, the synopsis is as follows. When Rocky begins eating at Pie Face Balboa's restaurant, he unintentionally eats an envelope with Balboa's protection money. As a result, mobsters take Balboa's daughter. Balboa, in desperation, asks Rocky to rescue his daughter, promising him ultimate reward of an all-you-can-eat buffet. And that's 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 the synopsis there. Um, I don't understand it personally. Even ignoring the bad framing that fails to create any kind of momentum for the adventure. The platforming itself, like gameplay wise, uh, is not fun. The levels are poorly designed and the momentum to my mind is entirely unpredictable. The game was, I mean, it was received, I suppose. The highest score given was like an 86 out of 100, 8.6 8 out of 10. The rest of the reviews just kind of sat around mid to basically just scathing. This was the first platformer Kashihara would ever direct, actually simultaneously being the first single player game he would ever direct. And then simultaneously again being the last in both subgenres per se. It seems that he just decided that the single player, more narratively threaded kind of style of game design didn't really suit his strengths as a director, at least. His next credit is not as significant per se, mainly in regards to the effect he had in the end product. He was not influential in this project by any stretch of the imagination. Um, editor's note that was incredibly wrong. He was actually a planning director. I'm not quite sure how that moral of the story do not use IMDB um, and him actually being influential uh, helps my point so uh, who really wins? The experience earned uh, working on this Sega property, uh, this Sega classic, is important to discussing the progression of his career especially in regards to which specific classic he actually had a hand in. Next credit was as a planning assistant second unit director on Shenmue the first. Shenmue is a single player game featuring a I heard you were splashed with mud from a speeding car. Narrative. Shenmue's piece de resistance is the presence of a wide variety of addictive mini games to complement the core fighting gameplay loop. Nonetheless, important to state that in his first years, his first brief period of exposure to the world of video game development, um, he was present on the Shenmue set, uh, for want of a better term. Uh, Shenmue is a fighting game, beat em up slash brawler certainly, but one with a focus on gameplay variety via fast addictive mini games. It was the framework that Yakuza, Yakuza. a global phenomenon, was built off of. His next directorial job uh, would be on Beach Spikers, a four player multiplayer game with a. Or kind of thread of like where I'm, where I'm, where I'm, where I'm after Beach Spikers, uh, Kashihara would actually step away from the director's chair to be a planner for F Zero GX. Um, planner sounds like it isn't significant. That is because we don't actually have that kind of planning job in the West. It's a distinctly Japanese discipline in game design. There just isn't an equivalent. The West. Uh, the planner is basically just the boss of everything. The visionary, I suppose, uh, would be the best way to kind of describe it in Western kind of terms. The planner will basically decide uh, what direction the game will go in in regards to like gameplay style and feel, uh, how the aesthetic should come across, and the genre. Uh, all this is done in written form as almost a bible of sorts for the developers to follow. Kashihara needed to translate the age-old F-Zero to the modern hardware of the Nintendo GameCube, which he did indeed do very well, I might add. This was another undisputed success for Kashihara, another sports game notch in his game development belt. With Kashihara's success in manning various sports game development teams within Sega, he was a natural choice for helming Sega's next big foray into the sports game market in 2007 with, you guessed it, Of course, without having peered through the windows of Sega HQ, it's pretty dark. Without having peered through the windows of Sega HQ, it is impossible to tell 
exactly how Kashihara affected each game he worked on, uh, but if we presume he followed his job description to the letter of the law, he was responsible for much of the world design in F-Zero GX. If there's one thing that makes GX stand out, not just on its own, but especially from older racing games, um, it's how the game portrayed the world and the characters who lived in it. This wasn't just an excellent sports game, you see, it was an excellent character-driven sports game. Uh, as such, Kashihara was perfect to helm a sports game featuring the world's most iconic characters. And while I can never know for certain, uh, it is my belief that they... I think they just approached the task from the wrong angle. Directors are instrumental in managing teams and allocating staff, and by how the teams were set up, we can kind of get a glimpse into the mindset of this director and of Sega Sport altogether for 2008's Beijing entry. More than 50% of the planning team had no experience in any kind of video game design outside of the sports realm, and all of them spent most of their careers in exclusive sports game development. Kasha himself was a sports game aficionado, as was programming director Naohiro Hirao. Uh, Koji Shindo had no experience in, well, anything. This was his first credit, and since then, he has worked exclusively on sports games and a Puyo Puyo Tetris entry. That was the planning team. Three sports game aficionados, or at least two sports game aficionados with one future sports game aficionado. This would, in any other context, be completely fine, except that Super Mario and Sonic at the Olympics thrives off of its characters, its fantasy. It's not a simulation at heart. When it is, that's when it's at its weakest. Remember the mission statement from earlier, I'd argue that experience within the character-driven game sphere uh, would supersede that of sports game development experience in this specific scenario, at least. And we've some pretty foolproof rationale to back up this claim. Vancouver 2010's Winter Olympic entry is heralded as the series' greatest entry, an all-time classic. This is down to the character, the presence of a story, little world-building details like a market square shops, the fact that every event takes place in a consistent environment, everything feels connected, ties everything together, even the dream events present scenarios that allow our characters to thrive off, well, their character. This is all in stark contrast to Beijing 2008, which thrived off of an inherent fantasy. They did not need to try that hard to clear the bar, and as such, they did not really try more than they needed to. This is fine, but they don't get that first time magic more than once. In Vancouver 2010, they were not content to ride momentum. They carefully crafted their own by honing in on what made the series magical. The magic. Compare Dream Table Tennis, where table tennis is still the focus, the main event going on in a miscellaneous environment, to Dream Ice Skating. where the ice skating is second to invading Bowser's castle and slaying perfect chaos. That is what I'm talking about. The difference. Takashi Izuka, the man behind the imaginative, epic, wide-sweeping, operatic, character-driven Sonic series helmed the project, with Shun Nakamura, also with Sonic Team fame, as his right-hand man. These were the guys behind wide-sweeping, operatic narratives like Sonic Adventure 2 and the admittedly somewhat incoherent but nonetheless ambitious Sonic 06. The team behind Winter 2010 were more focused on the character. They had cracked the code on what made the series work. Sonic Team, for all their foibles, were a team with a focus on creative action rather than accurate simulation. Taking this into consideration, the differences between Winter 2010 and Beijing 2008 are far easier to understand. It was the team's unique approach that carved out its niche. It was that approach that cracked the code. There's not a doubt in my mind that Kashihara was influenced by Izuka and Nakamura because London 2012 took what made Winter 2010 so excellent and proceeded to just knock it out of the stratosphere. Actually left them. 
let me ask you a question. When was the last time you truly, wholeheartedly cared about the Olympics? Can you remember a time where the Olympics unequivocally felt special. In recent years, my enthusiasm for the Olympics has severely waned. The 2014 Olympics was riddled with doping scandals. The 2016 Olympics was flooded with environmental controversy. The 2018 Olympics were overshadowed by the overbearing geopolitical tensions. The 2020 Olympics didn't even happen, and the 2022 Olympics you would be forgiven for believing never took place. The 2008 Olympics I don't have the strongest memories of, while the 2010 Olympics I remember quite fondly, but there has only ever been one Olympics that has truly stuck within my heart. There was a time where the Olympics felt significant, at least to me. Being English, when the Olympic Committee revealed that London would be the host city for the 2012 Olympic Games, it was a huge deal. I would have only been around 9 years old, balancing between that sweet spot of being able to understand the scope of the event without the more critical or cynical outlook one develops as they grow older. Before the Olympics even took place, I have vivid memories of whole primary school lessons dedicated to the Olympics. I remember drawing maps of the Olympic Village to show off to the rest of the class in some vaguely related maths lessons. I remember holding a giant replica of the Olympic torch during the Olympics itself. I remember everywhere you would turn, should there be a screen or monitor of any sort, it would almost certainly be broadcasting the games. Perhaps my personal experience living in England biases me, I must admit, but I don't care because experience is important. Throughout the whole Olympic season, I would play Marin Sonic at the London 2012 Olympics almost religiously. There's something about seeing wacky video game characters compete in your capital city that feels really magical, not to mention that this is easily one of the best in the franchise alongside Vancouver 2010. Mario and Sonic at the London Games is such a remarkable high point for the series, not because of its gameplay, not for its responsive controls, not for anything traditionally, scientifically, objectively good, no, this video game is excellent because of its feel, its unique identity. Nobody plays Mario and Sonic for deep, accurate simulation. This was just when the summer developers realised what they did play it for. Fantasy. No longer is each event in a miscellaneous place for a miscellaneous reason. This game's namesake is more relevant than ever. This game takes place in London. There's interesting trivia to be found about the city. The events reflect European favourites like football, Bitcoin, or equestrian sports. And the setting is clearly visible throughout every event, in every menu, and of course, through its pièce de résistance, through London Party. London Party takes place in Downing Street. You play as Boris Johnson. Oh wait, hold on a second. No, no, that's not London Party. That was a work event. That's actually a shit oh. joke. London Party is a multiplayer party mode akin to Mario Party. The core loop revolves around playing events and bonus games. These mini games per se are activated by interacting with various characters from both series and an overworld map, crucially resembling the streets of London. Stickers are awarded upon winning the various games, and the first player to fill their sticker sheet is the champion. Bonus games can consist of quizzes, where Omocha will test your real life London or Olympic or London Olympic trivia. The Red Shy Guy and Birdo will ask for more video game centric trivia to balance the advantage an Olympics enthusiast or perhaps an older brother, for example, would have competing against an Olympically unacquainted kid. This is perfect. It plays to the strengths of everybody Sega wants to A, turn into Sonic and Mario fans and B, turn into Olympic enthusiasts. Apart from the quizzes, there are a variety of overworld games like Tag or Collecting Coins and the like. These may seem silly, but they are excellent for characterization. I was a Sonic fan when I was a child. Or at least... I think I thought 
that I was at the time. The truth is, I was a Sonic fan that hadn't even begun to scratch the tip of the iceberg in regards to the lore of the series. For example, I thought Metal Sonic in London 2012 uh, was Metal Sonic from Sonic Heroes. As in, like, he came from that. That was his first kind of thing. I had no idea who Jet the Hawk was, and in truth, my first thought was that he was this guy. But from his characterization, from the fact that he challenges you to tag races, I had kind of get an impression of his character immediately, without having played this game. London Party offered a consistent, real, grounded environment for each character included to show off their personality. It was genius in retrospect, because allowing a character to dictate the course of play, to have dialogue, to respond to your actions offers far more characterization than pole vaulting ever could. This game deepened my investment and understanding of the lore of each series subconsciously. From Eggman Nega to Cream the Rabbit Hell to Birdo, for despite my ridiculous investment in the Super Mario series at this point, I barely knew Birdo as anything other than the last pick in Super Mario Sluggers. After three bonus games, a signal is given to the players that a mini game is about to start, and they could have used anything here. However, this production was dead set on translating London into to a digital environment, so of course they used Ben. This seems obvious in retrospect, but it really, really wasn't. Wii Party's Island board game, every Mario Party, Mario and Sonic 2008, every single multiplayer party video game dead set on translating a fictional world into the digital sphere puts the emphasis on the game. It would be more functional to have a ding followed by an announcer. Hell, it would have been more video game e to have a ring sound effect or a one-up sound effect. Uh, that should have been first instinct. But the choice to use Big Ben says to me that the developers cared less this time about making a game, but rather wanted to cultivate a feel. It's the little touches that let you know when the developers care. The act of having a knit to pick is not invalid because the knit itself is small. When a developer picks knits and removes them, they add in something special. The opposite of a knit is an artistic flourish, and that is why I so often lavish knit praises on my favourite works of art. When an artist cares enough to nitpick themselves, that means they care about you. They respect you. That there, in a nutshell, is why I love London Party so much. This contextual upgrade extends to the events themselves. Like previously mentioned, historically English events like football are present, but the dream events themselves have also seen a glow up reflective of the more concentrated direction from the design team. Dream fencing has been entirely changed for the better. Regular fencing is more reflective of the actual sport, but in Dream, the shackles of realism are thrown loose, like they should have long ago. I maintain that regular fencing remains a lackluster affair seeing as its more strategic nature doesn't really gel with the Mario and Sonic ethos, but I can forgive this specific instance because of the presence of Dream Fencing. Dream Fencing is a four-player battle to the death, with the only similarity it shares to the real sport being the idea of there being combat, I guess. The minigame being top-down is a genius change. It allows for far more control in navigation and, funnily enough, offers the player more tactical depth. The possibilities for a match are infinite, seeing as you have all three dimensions to play with. Dream Long Jump, once again, is a departure from the regular long jump. You flutter, jump, and glide through Yoshi's Island, making for a minigame more akin to a platforming challenge. This is exhilarating, not simply through gameplay, but because, well, it's, it's Yoshi's Island. And I'm playing as Shadow Disgusting the Hedgehog. Creature. The whimsy is dialed up to 100. This is a design team at their apex. The gameplay is fun for sure, but the concept itself, on an artistic level, it's just perfect. It makes logical sense that if long jump were a sport in this fictitious magical world, it would be a literal long jump across the sky. The designers sat down and asked themselves, how would this sport work in the world of Super Mario, for example? And they came to a logical conclusion. They didn't leave it there. They didn't pull a dream table tennis from 2009 and have the setting be random. No, they went into the quote-unquote lore and plucked a location that would make fans of the series go, wow, I recognize that, and less acquainted soon-to-be fans ravenous to learn more about the series, compelled by the presence of lore they never knew existed. Because that is creative integrity. That is is caring. This is true of all dream events. Dream Spacewalk at Sky Station Galaxy, Discs in Battle Rock Galaxy or Windy Valley, Equestrian Sports in Moo Moo Meadows, Rafting Down Cheap Cheap River, Uneven Bars in Grand Metropolis, Fencing in Ocean Palace, Trampolining in Crazy Gadget, and last, but most certainly not least, Sprinting Down Bingo Highway. 
in Dream Sprint. These developers cared, granted less so about making an excellent video game to play, the systems themselves saw little to no overhauling, but, but rather more so about creating a fantasy experience. They dug deep into the lore to create a world rich with personality. Not only is London 2012 setting a rich Olympic setting, but one that amalgamates Super Mario and Sonic together into said real-life location, digging deep into the manuscripts to craft an experience dripping in fan service spirit and creativity. London 2012's world feels tangible, not realistic, mind you. Super Mario Galaxy's world is not realistic, but it is more than tangible. You can go here if you'd like to know more about what I mean by that in excruciatingly verbose detail. And this is, of course, only speaking of the Wii version. Whereas before, the DS version was just a handheld version of the Wii game, this 3DS entry is unique. In fact, it is arguably better for one simple reason. It has a story mode. Forgive the pretentiousness, not everything is better with a story, but in, in this case specifically, in regards to the Olympic series, it most certainly is better with a story. This is a series founded on characters, on embodying a location. London Party focused on these individual strengths well, but 3DS's story mode knocks it out of the proverbial park. It is a case study in world building, where 2008 was a nebulous slipstream in time where the two just randomly played Olympics together. This story mode in 3DS in 2012 creates a world where the characters were invited to travel to London to compete. The entire setup for the plot is that our two antagonists, predictably being Bowser and and Eggman were not, which solidifies to an audience who may not have encountered these characters before. They're bad news. They weren't invited. If you recognize one of them, it becomes clear that their counterpart is the antagonist of the opposite series. The two antagonists develop a nasty cloud that creates fakers and imposters called the Phantasmal Fog, which, by the way, it's just beautiful that the main dilemma in Mario and Sonic's Olympic adventure in London is fog. Like, literal fog. The actual bane of the British everyman's livelihood. Bad fucking weather. That's just, that's just remarkable. There are 23 main episodes which take our heroes from the Olympic Stadium to Stonehenge to beat up and interrogate a magic Koopa all the way to Big Ben to face off against the almighty antagonistic duo. Okay, sorry, not sorry to jump in with an editor's note. Um, I would like to allocate three seconds to to drink in the splendor of this particular line delivered from fucking Bowser that started it all. It is true that Winter 2010's outing had a story mode, but even that story felt more grounded. Excellent, but nonetheless a very stereotypical sporting kind of story. London 2012's story, on the other hand, it's about actual body snatchers that live in the fog. Again, it's the fog. There is dialogue. There is characterization. Each character has a personality. Even if you haven't played any of the games in either character's catalogue, you will still feel as if you understand these characters. In one of these merged together fan ficky crossovers, it can often feel that the characters are not actually characters but avatars. Unity default animated skeletons in the skin of your favourite mascots. I know that was a weirdly specific criticism, but look at Jump Force and tell me I'm wrong. This was often felt throughout Beijing's 2008 entry. There wasn't much to define who these characters were, and at times, they ceased to be be themselves. I excused this in said segment as this was not a symptom of not caring, it was clearly just a symptom of not knowing. They hadn't fully figured out how to nail a crossover like this, how to add a narrative thread, because once again, it was a big ask at the time. If you hadn't played a game from either series, you'd be forgiven for not understanding who or what on God's green earth an Omo Chow or a Toad was. London 2012 creates an environment, provides context, and threads a narrative needle that subliminally catches everyone up to speed. Take a look at this picture. What's this person's interests? What are they like? Would you get along? These are unanswerable questions, and yet now, not so much. Mario and Sonic 2008 existed in a void, an empty null space consisting of an Olympic stadium and a menu that changed what it looked like. For a first entry, this is fine. It is nonetheless respectful because it is sincere. This is what they believed to be the definitive format, but it was not. I believe it was Izuka and Nakamura's influence after Winter 2010. Their expertise in character development and world building held just the Winter Village on its own that brought this series into a new era. If you think about it, the progression of this series truly is remarkable. 
from an admirable first effort to a knockout punch of a sequel to a triumphant lap in a sprint race, knee sliding and moon walking around the track because with confidence like that, nobody was going to catch up. This was an extravagant, flamboyant display of creativity and confidence with an immaculate execution to back all of that up. When we talk about the greats in the Mario Sports series, hell, when we talk about the greats in sports games, London 2012 deserves to be in the upper most echelon because it wears its heart on its sleeve. What a shame then. That success was so short lived. Editor's note I actually think, in retrospect, with the benefit of hindsight, um, the DS version was actually the main version, and they made an upscaled console version of the handheld game. I'll explain that now. If we look at the theme, right, if we look at the music of the game, it's all it all sounds better on the DS. All of it does sound better on the DS because the sound font they chose um, suits the DS's shitty kind of speakers. Um, it doesn't suit... The MIDI construction doesn't work on the Wii. It sounds fake. It sounds false. It sounds like they're imitating an orchestra rather than sounding like it is an orchestra whereas you don't get that problem on the ds which makes me wonder was that theme written for the ds where you can't really discern the instruments that well and it was just put on a clean version on the wii apart from that almost every single mini game plays better on the ds version it seems to me that they put more thought into the controls like i said um this is 2008 by the way i'm talking about uh, table tennis is remarkably good on the ds pretty shit on the wii um, fencing, likewise, a lot better on the DS. Uh, Dream Race, far better on the DS. I think if you take every single minigame after playing both back to back, capturing footage again and again, hundreds of hours into both, I think every single minigame in the DS version plays better and it has a, a better variety of them as well. There's boxing in the DS version and it's, it's class. It's far better than fencing is on the Wii anyway. I, I'm starting to think more and more that it was the DS version that was the main one. I have no proof whatsoever. Um, there were two different development teams. I can't judge which was the main version based on their development team. I can tell you that Winter 2010 was definitely built for the Wii, primarily, because you don't get Takashi Izuka and Shun Nakamura and not put them on the one you want to be the main version, um, which was Wii. But there's no kind of equivalent to that in 2008. I'm just essentially judging off of the sound of the music and the fact that the minigames on the DS clearly have more thought put into them because they are more fun. They're translated they're translated to that hardware better. It takes better advantage of that gimmick. It's more it's more deep. This is not this is not to say of course the Wii one's bad. It's not bad. Far from it. I mean you've heard the last section, but I do think that the I do think that the DS was the main one. Um it just seems like it was built for the DS. Everything, every fundamental like even down to the construct of the game, of being a lot of different minigames single player is a set of challenges it's very quick fire like pick up and play like pick up put it down you're on the train take it out play one or two mini games put it back in your bag do something else progress a little bit in your tournament it, it, it feels like it's built for a handheld the entire structure of the game i thought i'd throw that in because of that what's the line I, what's the line the ds version was just a handheld version uh, whereas before the ds version was just a handheld version that's true but i think that is that is the, the statement's still true i just think it disparages the ds version a bit um, the DS version was just a handheld version, yes. Uh, more accurately, the Wii version was just a console version of the handheld game. Um, the, point, so the point of that statement was that they were the same. They were the same game. Uh, there was not that much unique about either or uh, in 2008. And that's true. But if I could go back and rewrite that sentence, which I won't, seeing as I'm saying it now. The DS version was not just a handheld version of the console version. The console version was a console version of the handheld version. I'm sure that made sense. That was very concisely said, I think. 
And I'm back to the script. I think we'd best start with me laying my cards out on the table. Now, Rio 2016, to my mind, is terrible. Not because it is not fun to play, because at times it is, um, but because of how it lacks soul. London 2012 was a young flamboyant partygoer, the life and soul, the one whispering in the DJ's ear, the one with the most extravagant outfit, then Rio 2016 is that exact same person except it's the next night and they're hung over but they got invited and can't say no lest they ruin their social standing as a premium lad but by rocking up unshaven in the same clothes but with odd socks and having forgotten their coat on the bus they kind of end up tarnishing it anyway it's not as if they jumped the shark per se in london 2012 and even if they had the response to jumping the shark is is not sitting in a floaty um you need to at least try. Allow me to break down in explicit detail why Mario and Sonic's Rio 2016 Olympic outing is actually not that, and is rather a soulless dancing monkey spinning the sign. If Sochi 2014 was a misstep, then Rio 2016 proved that, that no, Sochi was not a misstep. This was Sega choosing to take the path on the left. Rio 2016 is a shell of a product that exists because it must, not because it should. They had the license and they needed to use it. It is the Fantastic Four, Fan Four Stick, whatever <laughs> stick of the Mario and Sonic series. There is no reason for this game to exist. There is no justification. There is no inspiration. It just kind of does. Not only does it fail to provide to us, the audience, a reason for it to exist, I'd argue it provides a reason for it not to. It has the most anemic event list yet, with plenty of cuts and only four new offerings. While it felt fitting to add football and equestrian sports to London's Olympics, um, tell me, what relevance do rugby, boxing, or golf have with Brazil? Rugby's only significance to the nation is that Brazil originally qualified for the first ever Rugby Sevens Olympic event, but ignoring that random historical factoid, a few would argue that rugby is a distinctly Brazilian sport. The nation has never even qualified for a Rugby World Cup. Rugby has very little to do with Brazil's sporting identity, uh, outside of the fact that it is a British sport that British colonizers brought to the country. But that's about it. It is not popular. Why not, instead of rugby, include basketball? Basketball is an exceptionally popular sport in Brazil, with courts, makeshift or not, adorning the streets of Rio. Its popularity is up there with the likes of football and beach volleyball. Instead of boxing, where throughout history Brazil have Two gold medals only in 2016 and 2021. Why not include a sport with deep roots in the culture uh, with popularity to boost? Why not include Olympic judo or try to translate Brazilian jiu-jitsu or mixed martial arts? And boxing has little to no popularity and a significance to equal that in the country. It is baffling why boxing was ever included, especially when all three of the other combat sports I just alluded to are massive in the country with Jose Aldo, a Brazilian UFC athlete, taking home another MMA title that very same year. The MMA record books are dominated by Brazilian icons, with jiu-jitsu and other strands of martial arts intrinsically linked into Brazilian culture. It was the obvious choice. One may argue that MMA is too visceral, jiu-jitsu too violent for a kid's game and that's a straw man argument, at best. If boxing is fine, if sword fighting is fine, if the shooting or karate games in the upcoming Tokyo entry would both be deemed fine, then there are ways to make MMA work in a manner that is not visually disturbing. And even if Olympic judo would need little to no censorship anyway. That is indeed an Olympic event, one that Brazil perform remarkably in, with strong Brazilian heritage. Or, you know what, even capoeira, that would be a remarkably unique event within the combat sphere. Perhaps judo is the main Olympic sport, with capoeira being the dream remixed version of judo. Basically, 
Anything but boxing. In regards to golf, I shouldn't actually need to tell you myself. Here's what the Brazilian officials have to say about the sports presence in Brazil. So let's get this straight. Golf is a nothing sport in Brazil. It has no presence. Why introduce it here? If we truly cared about representing Brazilian sporting heritage, if we really cared about giving this game an identity, uh, why not include surfing, skateboarding, futsal, handball, tennis, uh, sports popular among Brazilians of all ages? Instead of like, you know, golf, the sport that nobody plays. It's not even as if they were trying to just fill in the blanks in the event list, like events that hadn't been covered yet, because events are, are dropped all the time, and new ones are consistently brought in throughout the series history. Throughout the series history, it wasn't as if they were adding these sports out of necessity because like previously mentioned, where were futsal, handball and tennis? These are all Olympic sports that were not present in this edition or any other edition, mind you. If the goal is to eventually include every sport, which it isn't, because like previously mentioned, they chop and change the lineup, why not add in sports with relevance to the country's heritage before adding in sports that do not. The answer is, and believe me, I do not like saying this, so much so that I, I actually made a video about the people who say things like this about a year and a half ago, where I was absolutely scathing in my criticism of this specific criticism that I am about to give. But in this instance, I really struggle to see a scenario where they cared enough to care about the little things. It's obvious they cared while working on London 2012 and it's obvious they cared while working on Winter 2010. But in Rio, none of the events have any relation to the heritage of the host, likely signifying a lack of research. Not budget. Golf is new. They made new assets for golf and golf games are not exactly easy to develop, what with the infinite number of variables and, and as such, an infinite amount of potential for bugs. That time should have been put somewhere else, but it wasn't. And that misallocation of time was not for budgetary constraints. It was just an oversight. Unless someone higher up had a strong desire to include golf for some abstract marketing reason, golf's inclusion is a reflection on the team just not really caring that much. Uh, likewise with boxing, when other combat sports were so obvious. Rugby is another infuriating inclusion. It would have made sense for the London games, but not for Rio. However, credit where credit is due for including beach volleyball. That's a popular sport in Brazil. Rio even, especially. That was an excellent inclusion. But, and perhaps this is somewhat glass half empty of me, uh, that just creates more questions. Why care? enough to make one out of the four new events actually relevant to the hosting nation. What was the conversation here behind the scenes? And on the topic of the Olympic events in Rio, let's talk about the distillation of the magic in every prior entry, the dream events, or the lack thereof. Do you see this event select screen? As a kid, I looked at this and thought, wow, there sure must be a lot of unlockable dream events if None of them are here. Uh, one quick visit to Nintendo support later, and I was um, in a little bit of shock. After everything we've spoken of, after definitively coming to the conclusion uh, that Dream Events were a genius realization of everything the team wanted to achieve with this project, it surely seems unthinkable, right? Th that they just cut that. It, it seems crazy that they would just willingly remove the best part of the whole series. They removed a variety of events on top of this, with only 14 of them present compared to 20 in 2008 and 21 in 2012, added in four new events with nothing to do with the hosting nation, thus failing to build any semblance of character or world feel, and then they and took away all the dream events, violently sucking the fantasy out of the experience. And then, they failed to replace the story modes of past with... anything. 
London party was replaced with a lackluster tournament mode and hero showdown, which after breaking through a barrier of boredom to try, I found out that they're just minigame playlists. There's no kind of unique personality to either of them, it's just a way to randomly select and play some minigames. Now you might remember me saying at the start of this segment that I had trouble with corrupted footage, that is true, my Razor Ripsaw capture card was not agreeing with my Wii U for some strange reason, probably because it's Razor. So as such, I leave legally emulated by burning my Rio 2016 CD on my PC and uh, I say all this because the egregious glitch you are about to see in about three seconds uh, was not to do with Rio itself and entirely to do with the emulator that I was using. Okay. Back to the script. The beach event select screen is an excellent idea executed so dramatically poorly that it doesn't even matter. You walk around a beach on Rio where talking to the various NPCs does the job a button press normally would. Uh, talk to this person for mini games, this person for tournaments, etc. etc. I don't actually quite know how to feel about this inclusion in truth. It is a nice touch, that much is certain. It's a nice idea to switch up how the menu works to add a bit of personality, but, but while conceptually it sounds great, in execution, um, I find it nothing short of lacklustre. The main draw of this beach is that you can explore it and talk to the characters, kind of like a miniature Rosalina Observatory. Uh, technically the observatory could have been streamlined into a world map, but there are so many hidden details, so many references, so many characters aboard the observatory uh, that by streamlining you would miss out on so, so, so much world building. The time spent navigating the observatory is a necessary concession for what is gained. Again, you can look at these to hear more about that in once again, excruciatingly close detail. You as the player waste more time between levels, but you also get added context to the world that you wouldn't get otherwise. There are things to do, things to be seen, and it just adds to the immersion. Therefore, it justifies itself. In Rio 2016, you just waste time between the levels. There is nothing on the beach. It adds nothing to the immersion because if anything it routinely breaks immersion. You play as your me walking around the sands of this tiny little stretch of land and it is tiny and there is nothing to do except talk to characters and that is a whole nother kettle of fish all on its own. You either talk to someone who brings you to a different menu where you select options or you talk to someone who responds ish. It is just weird. Why is it that Big the Cat uh, specifically is the person who activates the menu where you change the background music, the me costumes, view the credits and access of settings? And nothing in his character design suggests technically gifted to me. Shy Guy activates ghost events. This one is annoying to me personally because um, there are literal ghosts in the Super Mario series called Booze. Why not use those? The answer to every single why here is that they have baked the idea. Conceptually, navigating a menu physically in an on-location set is, is great. It can help build character, um, but it doesn't build character because the characters used have no relevance to their actual in-canon purpose or what their design would suggest their purpose is. If Big the Cat was organizing a fishing tournament, now that would be a cute nod akin to Jet the Hawk asking to race in London Party. Instead, Big the Cat brings you to the settings. This in and of itself is proof to my mind that artistic flourishes were not all that high on the priority list because not thinking hard enough to come to the conclusion that any other character from like Tails to Egad to Iggy the Koopa to Rouge the Bat would have made for far better settings characters because in universe they are technicians or known for their technical savvy or intelligence. And Big the Cat is actually the opposite of all of that, which means he exists to be there like the way Mickey Mouse exists in Disneyland, of being the illusion of a friendly face. While I am absolutely aware that this is the nittiest of all nitpicks. It is such a remarkably easy nit to pick that one must wonder why on earth was this nit ever allowed to remain past the first 
draft. Characters in this game do not fulfill purposes that make sense, and they don't even act like themselves. Why is it that when speaking to Donkey Kong, he'll make a monkey noise, and then the game will translate his monkey speech into an eloquently worded sentence Shakespeare would be proud of? Why is it that Luigi, who also makes abstract noises, does not get subtitles? Is it like, that? oh, well, clearly, his exclamations are less legible than monkey screeching? I just don't get it. This beach does not feel like a beach where the Olympics are. It, it genuinely feels uncanny. The more time you spend on the beach, the more you feel like you're, you're caught in some half space between life and death. The, the twilight realm of the Mario world where nothing really makes sense but tangentially does enough to make you put off questioning what in the ever-loving shit is going on. If you'll allow me for a moment, look what happens when you start up Mario and Sonic at the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. Okay. Um. Now here's what happens when you start up London 2012. Okay, um, now here's what happens when you start up Rio 2016, released for Nintendo's most powerful console uh, of all time for when Rio released, and their first ever high definition console. Okay. Look how they massacred my boy. This is a project that I have a very hard time. It's not easy to be this scathing in criticism, um, but I find it difficult to respect this as an experience when it retailed for full price. It removed everything from the experience. There is no place, there is no fantasy, and there is no soul in Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games. And um, don't you know, I saved my most damning criticism. The game is not even that fun to play, especially not with friends. Because they took away what made the game a casual party game. They took away what made the game deep. They took away what made the game so versatile, so non-linear. What made the game just masterable enough so that you can come up with a technique, but just abstract enough, just intuitive enough, that anyone off the street with no video game experience could potentially give a grandmaster a good match. They took away... motion controls on a console with the best motion controls yet and likely ever. Let's go, let's go back to 100 meter race so I can categorically explain to you why this is terrible. Do you remember how intense 100 meter race was in 2008? How there were an infinite number of ways to win, how you could never master the game, but you could master your own individual technique and adapt it based on your opponent. Because that is crucial. The game you see could never be mastered, because there was no supreme technique, it was only your technique. If you decided to switch up stance based on your opponent off the back of a loss, um, that would have been your decision, and you would have had to think of a new, better technique for after that. The human limit could not be reached because the way to win was entirely non-linear. In Rio 2016, and not only is there a human limit, 
um, but you start smashing your head off of it very quickly. What you're seeing right here is a, a quick screenshot taken of a 100 meter race between myself and my brother. A result screen captured our third time playing the event. With this session taking place for the first time that I had booted up the game in about five years. Button prompts pop up on the screen. If you hit them all at the right time, uh, then you will always come first or second by about half a millisecond. How is this a party game? Put yourself in the shoes of a group of friends playing a fun, casual party game late at night, uh, possibly sharing beverages they acquired by busting out a trench coat and standing on each other's shoulders. You play the game once. Player one wins because he has played the game already and knows what buttons to press. And you play the game twice. Uh, now, player two is catching up, but player one still wins. Uh, you play the game three times. Player one wins for the third time in a row, but that's only because players two, three, and four just forgot to press two right when the pistol fires because they were charging up their run button with one. So you play the game four times. Uh, player one wins by half a millisecond because his avatar has longer legs. Um, everyone has perfected the game, um, but nobody cares because it stopped being fun after round two. If we're being honest, um, the only reason everyone is still playing after round three is that everyone kind of hates player one in real life, so they wanted to show him up. But by the time they did show him up, by the time they bumped their head off the ceiling, it actually didn't matter. Because a simulation style game with a set meta, a way to win, still devolved into RNG after each player's head smashed through the skill seal. Welcome to Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games' design. Similarly to With the Beach, the devs had a good idea, really, uh, that it would be a good idea to implement button controls, and yeah, for accessibility, that is a good option. But they didn't really think it through, they didn't think of a good way to implement them, they, they just did implement them. Uh, they just dropped the button controls into an inherently motion-based, non-linear control-driven game, and they broke it in the process. And it's just boring now. Each and every minigame has a definitive way to win, a definitive meta, a method to do things correctly. And yes, if two people have a perfect match, because that is now possible and happens all the time thanks to button controls, then the winner is decided based on RNG. The issue this game finds itself in is, is quite rare, actually. Because Mario Party doesn't fall into this trap because it's so, it is so openly casual and RNG based. Um, Smash Brothers and Mario Kart don't fall into this trap because while there is an element of RNG when you're like, using items and Smash Brothers, the skill ceiling itself is high. It is hard to be good at those games. Therefore, the casual RNG nature of Mario Kart specifically works better because it is hard to be a world champion. The issue with Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games is that it is structured like a Mario Kart where despite the RNG, the best player should win, except the skill ceiling is impressively low and as such it falls into a unique trap where it is skill based but the skills are not at all difficult or complicated to learn which ends up making it RNG based because when you have two players bumping their heads off the human limit then the winner will have to be decided based on a random number generation. There are no tactics and really Every game can be boiled down to the same formula. Press this button rapidly to build energy. Now time this button press, then time press, then time press, then time It breaks immersion because it doesn't take long to realize that these are basically just movies you're watching. You are watching the characters do things but you aren't really controlling them, you're just pressing buttons and the same ones as last time but just now they're doing something slightly different. It feels like you've exited the matrix. It feels like... it feels like a collection of quick time events. And you sit there and you watch as the game says, Well done, you are the best sailor the Seven Seas ever saw. Um, despite the fact that if the sailing overlay, because I mean, I guess that's kind of all the events are, overlays over a C-sharp command line asking for rhythmic inputs from the same buttons. 
in the same order. I've been replaced by the biking overlay. You still probably would have got on the podium um, because everything's the same. If your video game it makes me feel like I have exited the matrix if I suddenly realize the futility of my sitting there pressing buttons, you have failed as a designer. And it's so strange because London was such a remarkably well-designed, tight video game. Rio should have been a surefire success. But then I dove into the archives. First, as always, let's get the context out of the way. Let's, let's explain what the various credited roles in a development team mean. What are the various roles and sub-roles responsible for? Producers have nothing really to do with the game design per se. They manage time, deadlines and budget. On occasion, I suppose you could say the lack of budget, the lack of time or the abundance of either would have an effect on the design, uh, but by and large, the producer's effect on the actual end product of the game from a creative perspective is borderline non-existent. Game designers create the rules, character settings, stories and props for new games and use computer programming languages to write the required code. They also manage project teams and test early versions of the game. They have an enormous effect on the creative end product. Programmers do not hold creative roles, they just kind of follow orders. A director is a management role, but it is nonetheless creative as you attempt to create a, a, a team and a, a project and a product eventually in your vision. You are the boss. Via Indeed, we can see the various tasks on hand for the director. Okay, so let's break it down. Uh, Mario and Sonic Rio doesn't have a glitch problem. It doesn't necessarily have a deadline slash budget allocation problem that we know of, but we will revisit that in just a moment. However, I will nonetheless say that the producers, from what we know of, probably did a very commendable job. Which leaves the directors and the designers. Directors are indeed responsible for hiring staff, if not directly, then by advising for who would be suited. My problems with Mario and Sonic Rio 2016 are that there is a complete loss of its identity, a failure to fulfill the mission statement presented in 2007, and a lack of uniqueness, a lack of character. Everything feels very budget and recycled, which, which, as you will see, it kind of is. Animations and models are recycled often. Out of the seven designers who worked on London, uh, five of them retired from the series or just in general and the other two became lead designers. Out of these designers, uh, Yuka Nijima retired after London, Yugo Ogura worked on 2008, 2010 and 2012 and didn't return to the series or design in general. Koji Suizawa worked on 2010 and 2012 and then never came back. Asahaya Jinbo started with 2012, kept his role for Sachi and then got promoted to lead designer for 2016 and general designer for Tokyo 2020 while being a lead designer for official 2020. Yasushi Funakoshi has an insane credit history if I'm being honest and he's still doing very well. He only worked on 2012 in the Mario and Sonic series but has credits on Shunmu 1 and 2, Resident Evil Code Veronica, uh, Shin Megami Tensei 9, Win Back 2 and Dragon Quest 11. He never returned to the Mario and Sonic series after 2012. Shingo Kawakami has only ever worked on Olympic Games as a designer. Uh, he has credits on every Mario and Sonic as a designer, except 2008, where he was a planning section assistant. Starting with 2016, he became a lead game designer. Kota Terada was a planner on 2008 and a designer on 2010 and 2012. He then retired after that. For Rio 2016, Ayugo Kesahara returned to directorial duties. This would be the last time he'd ever direct an original game. Jingo Kawakami, the first of three level designers, has only ever in his life worked on the Mario and Sonic Olympic series. He's a sports developer by trade and a very specific one at that. Masai Jinbo, the second of three lead designers, has only ever worked on sports games and puzzle games. Mariko Kawase actually has a remarkable CV with a ridiculous amount of variety. He worked on many entries in the Yakuza series, Dragon Quest XI and Street Fighter V. He also worked on party games like Mario Party 9 and Wii Party U. Personally, from the outside, it seems that Kashihara set out to assemble a team of designers more so focused on creating accurate, engaging simulation-based games. 
I do not know for certain, but from the CVs of the staff on hand, from what the game turned out to be, from where all the emphasis was put, from where all the emphasis is absent, it seems clear that their heart was firmly in the place of creating an, an accu a more accurate simulation than, they, than they'd ever done before, or at the very least, uh, a more grounded one. Alternatively, the game could have been rushed, I don't exactly imagine it, by looking at the CVs of the folk working on the game, they had ample time to, to finish it. Different teams work on the winter and summer games, and even if they help each other out on the different editions, um, they still surely had staff working from London's completion to Rio's release. Another advantage of the winter team going first is that they already had HD models now to work with. And what's more, they had advice and experience on working with the then new Wii U. Yes, the, the deadline was strict, for sure the game had to come out before the Olympics happened, but it's always been the same. In a way, knowing exactly when the due date is with certainty is almost a blessing as the team can set realistic goals and pace themselves. Interestingly, however, in the case of this entry, this was the closest a game release has been to the actual Olympics kicking off in the history of, like, ever. Which means development must have really gone down to the wire after all. Unfortunately, um, all I can offer is my own conjecture. It seems obvious to me that the, the strengths of the series were rooted in, in the fantasy, in the, the non-linear control mechanism, in the magic, the personality, the uniqueness, the flavor. And Rio 2016, um, removed the best parts of every prior entry, doubling down on the bad parts. There's not really any passion present in this project, and that's a little bit heartbreaking, especially coming straight after the magnificence, the grandeur of London 2012. Um, one of, if we're going to go fully subjective, uh, one of my personal favourite multiplayer slash sport games of all time. It just feels, it feels hollow. Rio just feels hollow. I remember at the time of release, I, I sat down and thought to myself, this isn't great, but they're acquainted now with making HD versions of these games. Maybe this final product feels so shallow because they spent all their time making the fancy coat of paint. Next time around, that was a bit of a Belfast accent. Next time around. <laughs> I actually think that accent is sick, I kind of wish I had it. Next time around, I thought, okay, they don't have to use that paint to cover over a 2001 Ford Focus. Uh, instead, they can use this coat to apply a sheen to a well-oiled Ferrari. It will be in Tokyo, after all, the motherland of these two intergenerational mascots. This was, in, in retrospect, a condition that uh, Harvard's elite psychological department uh, coined as... Hope. Because 2020 did roll around, and it solidified to the world that this series was now the most accurate modern-day representation of modern sport. Where entities compete not on pitches, but on spreadsheets. Not comparing goals scored, but how their profit margins compare. Because this series had changed into what it was perhaps always supposed to be. Olympic merchandise. And here we are, the not-so-grand finale. Context was crucial in the beginning, and it remains crucial as we approach this, the final chapter. Tokyo 2020 heralded the return of dream events. That's cool. 
um, for the back of the box because there are only three dream events. And um, let's be honest, they never should have been removed. There are a variety of 8-bit events and this is cool, but only in the same way the, the beach in Rio was. I'm going to be frank, this was not thought through. The mini games in the loading screens for Splatoon had more replayability than these mini games and these mini games are supposed to be a selling point in, in actuality they are nothing more than charming easter eggs but even then they lose quite a lot of that charm when they're advertised as the main feature they're, they're not a feature though and as an easter egg goes it was poorly thought out why match an 8-bit mario with 16-bit sonic sprites why not use either the game gear sonic sprites or the snes mario sprites there is no reason to use the very first incarnation of the two other than a lack of artistry or creativity a nitpick for sure but how on earth wasn't this nit picked? The events bring back motion controls with buttons as an option too, and that's fine. But motion controls should have never not been included, and in a series that started out in 2008, you'd hope that they'd have figured out better accessibility options by, by 2010, let alone 2020. The new events this time around are surfing, skateboarding, climbing, and karate. Out of these events, karate is a fitting inclusion for Japan for sure, but surfing and skateboarding? These inclusions actively make me question what the development team was thinking. You see, the issue here for me is that these two new sports were perfect for the Rio incarnation. Once again, this, this issue of failing to world build by choosing events that don't really link in with the history and identity of the hosting nation is present. Bar karate, of course, which again was a fantastic inclusion. Sports like baseball and tennis are, are, are loved in Japan. Wouldn't you know it, golf and boxing are massively popular too. Okay, so let's just put this kind of mishandling into context for just a second. Two enormous sports in Brazil were not included in Brazil's entry. Instead, they chose boxing and golf, two Japanese favourites. Then, when Japan's Olympics rolled around, they thought it'd be a good idea to use skateboarding and surfing and to cut golf and keep boxing. Fair play for keeping boxing, I suppose, but its inclusion no longer reflects a desire to represent the sporting legacy of the host and reflects the fact that it was in the last one, so here it is, I guess. The cherry on top of this cake is that the motion controls, I'm sorry to say, are, are worse than ever. The accelerometers and gyroscopes in the Joy-Cons are nothing compared to the precision of the Wiimote paired with the motion bar. The main issue to me in regards to the gameplay itself on a fundamental level is that every single minigame in this game plays worse because they have to make up for the more lackluster motion control uh, by providing a greater flexibility in regards to the timings and the posture one needs to perform. The games themselves are less complicated and less precise to make up for the fact that the Joy-Cons themselves are less complicated and less precise. Therefore, the definitive best way to play the game is with button controls. In fact, it often feels like the game was built around button controls with the motion thrown in as an afterthought, which is entirely fine, uh, but if that's the case, then you're going to need to try harder to create deeper gameplay systems because you can't rely on the novelty of the non-linear motion system and they don't really try harder to do that the, the gameplay itself is not deep it is shallow there's nothing at all interesting about the gameplay design of mario and sonic at the olympic games tokyo 2020 it simply tries to ape the format of its predecessors uh, without half of the technical nous or design integrity each and every mini game in the selection plays worse than its 2008 and 2012 counterparts. In my mind, there is no point trying to replicate what your predecessor was so good at if you simply do not have the hardware to do so. From my perspective, if you're going to try to recapture uh, something special from 2008, um, you'd really want to at least live up to what 2008 was on a fundamental level. And realistically, you'd want to go beyond then, not settle for slightly less creative, less complicated, less interesting, less fun to play. Perhaps there's no better signifier of this new, more dull, more standard, more default approach than the, the box art itself. The two mascots standing side by side holding a medal compared to Rio's, compared to London's, compared to 
every winter cover. It strikes me as very last minute. Once again, we've returned to the, the dull main themes in comparison to the wide sweeping operatic OSTs present in winter and London. Have a listen to this main theme and try now to discern it from that original 2008 bog standard main theme. They are cut from the same cloth. Tokyo 2020 is a performance akin to a band from the 80s or 70s making their grand return to the stage in 2020, but you know, this time it's just not the same. For sure, we can let it slide because of our nostalgic connection to the property, the band, um, but the facts are that this is the same dog doing the same tricks, and it's been 12 years, and they're arguably doing those tricks worse, because the dog is pretty old now. For all of these reasons, I do not enjoy any one minigame in this collection. Even if we ignore how lackluster the gameplay is compared to its predecessors, um, the whole experience just feels soulless. Within the context of everything else surrounding this game, it just feels like an afterthought, like something that had to be produced because of a legal agreement, rather than something that came from somebody's heart. Many of the animations are reused, like the table tennis victory animations, the poses of the characters in the select screen that were taken directly from Mario and Sonic at the Sochi 2014 Olympic Winter Games. The victory poses even of the characters in the award ceremony were ripped from Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games. But many will say that Tokyo 2020 actually has a lot of content because it brings back the story mode, for example, uh, which we will uh, no doubt get to. I'd argue that that is just an illusion. You see, every single prior entry in the series had two entries, a handheld and console version. Now imagine if we were to consolidate the content between each of these console and handheld versions into one definitive version for each specific entry. Now look how bereft of content Tokyo 2020 is. I know you might be thinking, okay, but that's unfair because Tokyo 2020 is one game and these other ones are two games. It's not fair to compare one game to two different ones, but I'd argue that it absolutely is because Tokyo 20 20 was made for the Nintendo Switch, and thus that version stands in for the handheld version and the console version, which means they had a laser tight pinpoint focus on one version of a game as against splitting their attention between two different ones. Therefore, it is fair to compare Tokyo 2020 to two different games because it should have the content of two different games, and it barely has enough content for one game. Playing Tokyo 2020 feels like playing a tribute to Mario and Sonic at the Olympics 2008. The events are in HD, sure, but the motion controls are worse. And the fact that someone else can just cheese the games by learning when to press the buttons just sucks the fun out of the experience. Let me put it into perspective. There, there is a reason, you see, to play Rio 2016. It is, it is different from everything else in, in a terrible way, for sure. It is a worse version of the old formula, uh, but it is still, at the very least, interesting. And in truth, there is possibly someone out there who likes Rio the most because it is different. Tokyo 2020 is not bad or good, it is just a snooze fest because it takes inspiration from the very first game in the series and tries to replicate that formula with a worse set of controls, a poorly structured meta, less dream events, well, and actually I suppose, well actually more quote unquote creativity but, um, Perhaps I'm being harsh here, but I, I'd argue that that's by default. Beijing was a minigame select screen, 
that's it. But you might remember me saying about Sega's Olympic Sim in 2008 that context was crucial and it remains crucial today. In 2008, what it was was all it needed to be, that's all anyone wanted it to be. Tokyo 2020 released in the year of our lord 2019, 12 years after Beijing 2008, an entire two console generations later after the jump to high definition. The formula was more established, there were more developers to draw from, there was more experience on hand, they had more time than ever, seeing as nobody made a 2018 edition, meaning they had all hands on deck, they had more staff than ever, featuring upwards of four different development teams, and most importantly, they still had the two biggest video game icons of all time. Now, bigger than ever, fit with an infinite selection of characters and worlds to pluck from. And with all that, they created a video toy that failed to recapture the non-linear controls of 2008, had less creativity than Vancouver Winter 2010 or the Summer London 2012 games, and not bankrupt, mind you, in both, like the way Rio 2016 was just depressingly worse. Tokyo 2020 glitters, it is shiny, but beneath that facade, that beautiful veneer, um, it's hollow. Empty. There's nothing there. Tokyo 2020 is not good. It's just shiny. <laughs> Imagine that growing up, your mother would make sandwiches for you. You loved these sandwiches. You loved the way the chicken, lettuce, tomato, and mayonnaise mixed together. Then, when you were a teenager, she stopped making you sandwiches because, you know, you were old enough to, to make your own. Instead, she'd give you money to buy lunch at the deli, where you would buy a pot noodle every day. You ate pot noodles for eight days years. And let, let's be honest, they were worse. Actually, they were terrible. You just wanted one of those classic sandwiches again. Then, then out of the blue, out of nowhere, your family decided to go on a picnic and your mother made sandwiches. Thank Christ, you thought. Finally, after all these years, I can have a sandwich again. And you got the sandwich. It was in your hands and you tasted it. And then you realized in that specific moment that this was the exact same sandwich from 12 years ago. No, like the, um, the exact same. Because in the time since, you forgot that pairing margarine with low-fat mayonnaise was the norm. That was the dietary trend. Nowadays, it has been categorically decided- Hey, um, editor's note, I have no clue why I said that, because first off, I know jack shit about diet, but if there is one thing I do know, it's that nothing is categorical. That doing that is not worth it for how much worse it is compared to the normal stuff. Uh, your mother is still using the same bread she buys from the baker down the street who operates out of her shed, even though far better bakeries exist now where they use big ovens, trained chefs, modern techniques and real equipment. The chicken in the sandwich, as it turns out, is turkey and it was always turkey because your mother wanted you to eat turkey and knew you wouldn't eat it unless you called it chicken. The sandwich tastes the exact same and it tastes fine, but it's been 12 goddamn years and you thought it would taste good. The fact that the sandwich hasn't changed at all makes the sandwich bad, actually. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Tokyo 2020 Games is a bad sandwich. Just after saying that all out loud, I think I'm probably gonna cut that. That must be the most unnecessarily long-winded and stupid analogy maybe anybody's ever written. I must say that it's fantastic that the story mode returns and the situations are wacky and goofy and the overdramatic story is just what you'd want in a game like this, but it's not enough. The wacky framing 
doesn't forgive the fact that you have to play these dull events over and over again. The fact that there is dialogue doesn't excuse the lackluster 8-bit implementation. The presence of a story doesn't justify how absurdly long it lasts. There is a misconception that more content means better game. This is not true. What is true is that that suits marketing teams very well. On the trailers, on the back of the box, on all of the ads, there exists the proud declaration that there is a story mode. I find it only fair then that every review ought to exclaim to the reader that there is a story mode, yes, and it is not that good. It is too long, the minigames are not fun, and the framing of the story, while once again nice in theory, is executed in a manner completely bereft of creativity. It is evident that an executive walked into the room and said, put a story mode in, and the team said, okay, and the exec said, nothing. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't ask anything because them saying, okay, it was good enough to him. There needed to be a story mode, and the quality of that story mode says to me that there just needed to be a story mode. It didn't need to be good. In Vancouver 2010 and London 2012, the story existed to create a, a world feel, to create a sense of place, to give purpose to the characters. In 2020, it serves to give a cool tagline for the back of the box, for money. Because this, once again, is not a game. This here is a product. This game was directed by Now Hero Hero. Hero has directed four games in his life. Three of these games were Puyo Puyo Tetris esque games and the other was Mario and Sonic at the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. Uh, Hirao is a programmer by trade, he is credited as such on 10 different games and that's not including his technology work or projects where he's credited as a special thanks. He works predominantly on, you guessed it, sports games and um, he's excellent at it. But Izuka and Kasahara left enormous boots to fill and taking that into context, uh, you have to empathise with Hirao. Two lead designers from Rio stay on, with Masahai Jinbo replaced by Takao Hirabayashi, a designer focused mostly on the Sonic series, with credits on Sonic Colors, Sonic Unleashed, Sonic Lost World, and Sonic Runners. He was a game planner on a Wacky World of Sports 2009, likely a contributing factor as to why he was hired. Why Tokyo 2020 is as uninspired as it is, is a mystery. Perhaps Hirao lacked the experience of an Izuka to helm the project. Perhaps the likes of Kawakami, Marake, and Hirabayashi lacked the nous of a Nakamura, or maybe, and this is my belief, as an aside, If we go through the credits for every member of the staff on this game, everyone has been working on this series for a very long time, with most having been on since 2007. Each game in the series is fairly similar. The fact that there is a clear decline in the creativity present in each game leads me to one conclusion. Burnout. Imagine for a second, if every Mario game from 1986 onward was a 2D side-scroller that followed a formula of which world followed which. They'd get less creative. Because staff would get burned out and nobody knew would want to join the team. I can't, you can't, we can't. Nobody can, nobody can pinpoint who stole the soul of Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games as a series because it was not one person. It was a collective effort, for lack of a better term. It was the Olympic Committee with the goals they needed fulfilled. It was Sega on a tight deadline. It was Sonic Team and Sega Sport designating the work to the same people. And it was also us. It was us, the players, on every reveal trailer saying, yeah, the Olympics are cool, but when are we going to get a real game with these two new characters? Because this was a real job for the people behind the scenes. They put their heart on the table. And we looked at it, time and time again, and asked them, when are you going to give us a real game? Because this was a real job for the people behind the scenes, one that would never, ever end. And as time went on, as the comments rolled in, comments like the same as always, or just another sports game, or just some dumb shovelware, parts of each developer on the team would die as they realized that 
no matter how hard they tried to create an artistically pure creation. It would never, ever be good enough. I wish I could love Tokyo and I hope I love Paris if they make it, but I do know that I should have appreciated this series more, as much as I do now, back when I should have had. Mario and Sonic as a series, to my mind, was mishandled. And I will miss it, because it was once upon a time very special indeed.